This podcast is part of the Everyday Heroes Podcast Network, the network for first responders and those who support them. Disclaimer. All views expressed on what makes us fire are solely those of the person or persons giving them. What makes us fire does not represent or claim to represent any particular city or fire department and therefore make the claim that all views and standpoints are affiliated with what makes us fire and with what makes us fire only. Any mention of certain fire departments or cities within the interviews are solely for informational and opinion-based dialogue. In short, if you have a problem with what's published, just say something about it and don't be a Richard. What is up? What makes us fire? This is Josh, your host of What Makes Us Fire podcast, founder of the What Makes Us Fire nonprofit foundation. Thank you for joining us on the show today. Before we get started, I'm going to go ahead and run through a few things that we got going on with the What Makes Us Fire nonprofit foundation. We have a huge meetup coming up in October, October 15th through the 17th in San Antonio, Texas. It is What Makes Us Fire TikTok Riverwalk Takeover. We are taking over the San Antonio Riverwalk for a huge meetup where all proceeds of this meetup go to help benefit the nonprofit foundation. So what I want to do is I want to say thank you to a few of the sponsors that we have in San Antonio and to our host hotel, just to give them a shout out, let them know we say thank you very much and that their help towards the nonprofit does not go unappreciated. First and foremost is our host hotel, the Holiday Inn on the Riverwalk guys they were huge for us they gave us a great discount to help with the nonprofit. they blocked off rooms for us they were a huge help they are continuing to be a huge help in helping us work around their schedules and work around their venue i cannot say thank you enough to the holiday in on the san antonio river walk you guys if you're ever in san antonio check out that spot it is a good spot it's right on the river walk you see the water you can't miss it just a block away from the alamo It's a great, 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 great place to check out and relax and just go to after a night on the Riverwalk, right? I mean, why not? Second, I want to go ahead and give a huge shout out to all the event venues that we have for the Riverwalk Takeover. On October 15th, we are doing a huge hub crawl. We have five different establishments that have been working with the nonprofit and that are offering some pretty cool deals for everybody that is a part of the event. First is Howl at the Moon, huge dance hall. They have a dueling piano bar. It is awesome. Outdoor patio, uh, dancing floor, tables everywhere, full bars. It is an amazing experience at Howl at the Moon, you guys. This place is probably going to be the place where we end both nights at. Just saying. Second, is where we are going to have our main event for the night. It is a place called Merkaba, which is actually a sister location to Howl at the Moon, just down the stairs. Can't miss it. This is where we are going to have our costume party, masquerade ball, auction, dancing, drinking. This place, you guys, I'm telling you, it might not look big, but it's plenty of room. They have plenty of outdoor area. It's gonna be in October, so the weather's gonna be comfortable. This place is amazing. Go check it out if you're in the San Antonio area. Third, Alcapulco Sands, a pretty new place, and they're building something even newer above. This place has karaoke, large open floors, full bar. Again, this place is fun, it is lively, it is loud. Just the perfect place for all of us to go have a good time. Rocky's Patio Bar, this place is really new. And I, when I say really new, I mean really new. All outdoor seating, this venue has done nothing but support the nonprofit. Can't thank them enough. This place will definitely be a huge spot for me. I probably be hanging out there a lot because of all the help that they've been helping with the nonprofit. Last and not least is our restaurant slash bar. This place has probably done a lot for us, more so than the other venues because they are going a little bit above and beyond in that they are creating their own special menu for us. It is the Republic of Texas restaurant on the Riverwalk. You guys, they have created a special menu for event participants. They are doing happy hour 
all night long for everybody wearing your lanyard. And they are going to be giving the proceeds of those drinks and eats to the nonprofit. Their food is amazing. Their atmosphere is great. Plenty of indoor and outdoor seating. This place is awesome. This is going to be where I start off the night for sure because I'm going to have to eat something. I'm going to have to make sure I got my energy going and everything else. This is the place where the night will be started. Best believe that. I want to let everybody know, everybody wearing a lanyard gets into these places for free and gets their specials. That, that's it. That, that's what you need to get the specials, right? So there's going to be no cover to any of these places for everybody wearing a lanyard. And there will be drink specials and everything else as you're there. So get your lanyard. Come on out to San Antonio, Texas, October 15th through the 17th. Go to whatmakesusfire.com. Click on the events tab. You'll see TikTok Takeover. Click on that. You will see the itinerary. That is it for our establishments and our host hotel. Again, I want to thank all of them for helping support the nonprofit. We are a baby nonprofit, and they knew this, and they wanted to help anyway. So again, Holiday Inn on the Riverwalk, Hell at the Moon, Mercaba, Acapulco Sam's, Rocky's Patio Bar, and the Republic of Texas Restaurant. Thank you all from the One Makes Us Fire Nonprofit Foundation and from myself, Josh. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Moving forward, you guys, today on the podcast, I have somebody that I've been trying to get on the damn podcast for months. For months. And while I've been trying to get her on the podcast, we grew this really, really tight relationship. She's an amazing human being, smart, tenacious, strong. And when I say strong, she's strong and very, very, very not afraid to speak her mind. Her name is Lauren. She is a wildland firefighter. She's had a pretty rough go at it at the beginning of life, you know, growing up, through some pretty rough times, times that you're gonna be able to hear her talk about. But she found a way through it. She found a way to combat it. And she found herself in a career where that strength she had to find to combat everything she went through plays perfectly into the career that she finds herself in as a wildland firefighter. We talk a little bit about what the struggles are between the different types of fire service and how and what we can do to start making the change for everybody in a civil service realm when it comes to their mental health, when it comes to being taken care of by the company, city, county, government you work for. So without saying too much else, I want everybody to take a minute, sit back, relax, enjoy this episode. It's a damn good friend, She's beautiful as can be. I can't thank her enough for being in my life. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Lauren. It's, don't worry about the voice. It's just, it's just this voice. Letting you know now that whatever you say can and will be used against you. Okay. Well, luckily for me, I have, I have family in law. <laughs> Um, so, Miss Lauren, you're going to see me turn it on a little bit for podcast, I always do. You're uh, fine. Call me out on my bullshit. It's all good. Uh, you are a very close friend of mine, and I am okay with you calling me out on all that stuff. Wow, that video looks really bad on my end. Let's see. They call. There we go. I'll we'll just do this. Put, put one of your What Makes Us Fire shirts up in the... Oh, you know, look at you with ideas and stuff. Yeah, there you go. Because I live out of my truck, literally. Uh, Happens. Right. Oh, everybody, what makes us fire family? Guess what? You are listening to this podcast with Miss Lauren Fire from my truck. That's right. I was doing a lot of planning with the nonprofit in San Antonio. We had this podcast planned to go. Plans didn't go as planned, so now guess what? 
recording here in my truck. I am using, um, this is not an endorsement in any way, shape, or form. I am using Starbucks Wi-Fi uh, because I can to do this uh, interview. So, Lauren just Well, you bought a stuff. coffee, so. I did not buy a coffee. Is that bad? Should I buy no, a anything that you say can and will be used against you. Oh, fuck my life. Uh, heads up. You know, you've listened to the podcast. Language is all good. So shit, piss, fuck, cock, cocksucker, motherfucker, just fuck, turtwat. All of it is good to go. You can say whatever you want. This is an 18 and up show. We're going to talk oh, a little God. bit heavy. Yeah, we're going to talk a little bit heavy stuff. Now, you and I have had conversations in the past already. They just haven't been recorded about some of the stuff that we're going to talk about. If there's anything that you don't want to talk about, let me know. I can edit it out and or I'll just keep it in. And that way people know not to ask you about it. Well, no, because that's what this is kind of all about. And this is I'm hoping that this will get some other people to start talking. Ah, anyone in spe anyone specifically? Yeah, my twin sister. Oh, OK. Oh, all right. Cool. Well, Change. hopefully I can get her yeah. on the show. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Boy. Yeah. She wants. She wants to. She wants to see what happens. How this, she wants to see how this one goes. Oh, so are you doing this just to see, just to get her going? No, a little bit of both. I think. I think that it's been more or less for me, mm -hmm. but given some recent circumstances, I think that she would benefit from this. Cool. As well. well well, you know, a lot of people come on the show and they start thinking and talking about things they didn't think they would think and talk about. Uh, I've had a couple of guests come back at me and go, hey, man, I just want to say thank you uh, because of you. I started this or because of you. I started that or I stopped this or I stopped that. And I was just like, it wasn't because of me. You made the choice. I just said, I challenge you to do this and you accepted the challenge. So, yeah. And you've, you've talked about it. A few months ago, and I was like, "No, <laughs> no, oh shit, yeah." I was just like, "Hey, you're a female wildland firefighter. Get on the fucking show. Come on, come share your story. I think it'd be great." And you're like, "Fuck you." And I'm like, "Okay, can we still be friends?" And you're like, "Sure." I was like, "All right, whoo, dodge the bullet." <laughs> that, that's pretty All much right. how it went. That's yeah. pretty much how it went. If you keep playing right. with your hair, you're going to keep hitting that mic. Oh, it's sorry. Keep making noises. Oh, sorry. Don't be nervous. It's okay. Just like, just remember, like, like, act like we were hanging out in, when you were came when you came to Texas. Just act like that. Okay. All right. Just natural, normal, fun, loving self. <laughs> and drunk. I forgot about that part. <laughs> Max. <laughs> I wasn't All drunk right. the whole entire time. No, 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 not the whole entire time. Oh my god. Oh god, my truck is so fucking dirty. Y'all don't everybody watching on YouTube, just ignore it. Yeah. It's not that bad. Um you've heard the show before, you've heard it plenty of times. Uh mm -hmm. I'd like to introduce you uh to the audience, really. Let them know who you are, how we met, how I got you on the show. We kind of been bantering back and forth a little bit, bullshit, and trying to loosen you up a little bit because you were still sitting a little stiff. I'm not even stiff right now. Bad joke. No pun intended. <laughs> uh, so the idea is just to get you to relax. The, it, I know we're being recorded, and I know it's going to be broadcasted worldwide. No pressure. But just act like we've talked before. There's really... There's no expectation here. Okay. All right. So just. <sighs> like everybody watching you right now can see that you're just like. Well, What's the I, next? I, I need I'm the next slouching. question. Give me the next question. No, no, not really. I'm, I'm slouching. I'm, I don't know. I got done working out. So my, my shoulder. Oh, so you're just, uh, that's yeah, it. Okay. I'm you're just, just like, <laughs> Just feeling the pump. That's what it is. I got yeah. you. All right. So Lauren, also known uh, as Lauren Fire on social media, TikTok, really. I think <laughs> Lauren Fire 85, 88, 87. 2232. Son of a bitch. It wasn't even close. 
And <laughs> Lauren Fire two two three two on social media on TikTok is how we actually met. And it was it was very interesting how we met because you were one of the first, if not the first person, to openly admit that you vetted me before even thinking about following or uh, starting to talk to me, which mm -hmm. I respected like that. I respected 110%. I, I even told you, it was like, that's literally, I already knew I liked you. The fact that you said, I don't know if I can trust you right off the bat and then vetted me. Like, I was just like, I like her. She doesn't trust me right off the bat. I like her. It, I know it's a weird thing, but that's what it was. And after a while, you found, you figured out what, what Makes Us Fire was about, what the nonprofit was about. We started talking. You got to know, we got to know each other a little bit more. And I remember one time I was uh, f scrolling through TikTok way back when, and all of a sudden I see my face behind you. Mind you, we only, we only, we only like talked. We didn't talk on the phone. We didn't talk via messages literally we only talked from you being in the live mm -hmm. you were in my live you were asking me a shit ton of questions i was all willing to answer them and then i think a day or something later or later on that night i don't remember i'm flowing through and i see you live and my face is on behind you and i'm like whoa what's going on here i'm like thinking is she fucking bad mouthing me already <laughs> i had no idea what you were doing i thought you could be like i thought you were going like do not follow this guy this guy's weird no, nope, I was face. No, you were actually I was promoting. I was actually I was really impressed with what you guys were trying to accomplish and what you guys were trying to build because there are so many first responders out there that are taught to leave it at the door. Mm -hmm. You're coming to work, you need to put it away and lock it up. Right. So it was kind of refreshing and the fact that you were able to go beyond just fire department you went to volunteers you went to military active non-active veterans all that and mm -hmm. there's not a lot of organizations out there that do that there's not and as a matter of fact i can guarantee you there at least i haven't found one i can guarantee you that i haven't found one um that, of course but i have not seen any type of uh non-profit organization that is trying to do what we're doing and that financial help, right? A lot of organizations will offer the free treatment, offer a place for them to go and all this other stuff. But the thing is, is what these places forget is that if this person takes that treatment and it's free and it's awesome, that is something they need. If they go and take that treatment, where are they supplementing that income that they're now no longer able to go work? Yeah. Where, how are no they kidding. supplement? How are they going to pay for the groceries and the bills while they're going to take care of themselves? Now, there. Don't get me wrong. Treatment's expensive as fuck. It's no. It's no small thing in any way, shape, or form. So, getting a place or having a place that's offering free treatment or you know willing to help them that's huge. But we're forgetting the grand scheme of everything. I've noticed all these nonprofits and all these things that want to help within this mental health realm. They're only helping with one part. Yes. And it's okay that, that, that they're needed, but they're not helping with the whole thing. Like when, when that person's going to get help, who's taking care of the family? Who's there for the family? Who's taking care of the bills? Who's going to work? Who's Hey, we had some honeydews that now are going to be put on hold for two months. How are we going to take care of those? He always cut the grass. I, I now need to hire somebody to cut the grass or she always cut the grass, whatever. Yeah. You know, there's all these things and finances, money, as simple as it is, is the thing that holds a lot of people back from getting the help that they're looking for. Oh, yeah. And so I said, you know what? Let's just take care of it all. Take care of it all. Treatment. Will supplement their income while they're in treatment. I mean, we're looking for for to help one person. We're looking at a subs substantial amount of of resources, funds to take care of that person. But it's they're deserving of. Yeah. No matter who they are, volunteer, veteran, retired, cop, firefighter, doesn't matter. EMT, 
if you're a first responder or a military, we're taking care of you. You mm-hmm. and your family deserve it. <clears throat> um, and you did that, and you sorry, I just you got me. You got me on my soapbox with the damn thing. I I like hearing about it because each time you talk about it, there's more information that I'm learning as far as the nonprofit goes and stuff like that. So it's beneficial for me as well because this is something that I can also tell wildland firefighters that are having difficulties. Right. Hey, you should probably go check this person out. They do X, Y, and Z. Uh, especially when you lose a firefighter on the line and right. there is no, you get like a couple days off to kind of grasp it, understand it. No, it's go to work the next day. There is no stopping. Well, uh, that believe it or not, that's a, uh... It's actually something that a lot of civil service jobs have. Um, mm-hmm. You know, a brother or sister passes either by line of duty or something external. You know, they'll they'll be like, okay, well, we're bringing in a crisis management team or we're bringing in a counselor. If you guys need to talk, go ahead and talk to them. It's like, thanks, but no thanks. Yeah, and that's even if a crisis management team is available. Right. 90% and of the time, they're not. <clears throat> no, they're not. And we're going to get into all that. We squirreled off into the nonprofit and everything. Yes. And we, we will get into everything, I promise, and I will try to keep us on track. But uh, So that's how we met. I found out, holy shit, she's talking about me behind my back. It was good. It was awesome. And so we started this, we started this uh, friendship, this back and forth started PMing each other. We started talking. We exchanged phone numbers and we just became because you wanted to help. And Mm -hmm. from you wanting to help a friendship grew. And I think it's more than just a normal friendship by this point. And it's, you're one of my best friends that I've made recently. And somebody (laughs) do not use, you didn't even do it right. I can't do it like the best can. I can't do, the do like the, thing. You gotta, the sh- but the headphones static. <sighs> anyway, and you've become somebody very close to me in my life. Somebody that's been a huge support. I hope I've been there for you just as much as I feel like you've been there for me. You have. And, well, that's awesome. It's good to hear. And I'm just not <laughs> a very, I, I, I don't open up a lot and I tend to shut oh, down. Oh, no so. shit. No shit. And we're going to get into that. And I'm going to go ahead and okay. let everybody know. Y'all, you guys, you guys heard the term, she's a tough nut to crack, or he's a tough nut to crack. Yeah. You guys know that pistachio that you get in the bag that isn't open. You got to like fucking crack it with your teeth. And if you don't do it right, little shard stabs you in the tongue. Yeah, that's her. <laughs> that's, that's Lauren. She's the, if you do crack her, it's going to hurt you pretty much. So anyway, yeah, the we'll, fact we'll, that you referred that to nuts on top oh of that, <laughs> sorry, couldn't help no, you're it. Good. You're good. You're good. But yeah, we've grown this friendship, and I remember at first I was like, "Oh, you're a wildland firefighter. I'd love to have you on the show." Adamantly against it. Adamantly against it. Mm-hmm. We have a guest on the podcast, everybody. We do have a guest on the podcast. <laughs> that is Bobby. That is my other half. Hi, Bobby. Welcome to the What Makes Us Fire podcast. Oh, he can't hear me. I'm in your, I'm in your headphone. I forgot. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Squirrel. <laughs> this is real life. Real life things happen on the What Makes Us Fire podcast, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Uh, and so now here we are. You, you did not want to be on the podcast. Like you were adamantly against it. You had the, you literally, when I talked to you, you had the idea of the stigma was so strong in your mind that it was like, no, I cannot talk about any of this shit because people that I work with will blah, 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 blah. And I was just like, but that's the point of why I want you on here. So you can kill that stigma. And you're just like, yeah, no. Oh, okay. okay. I'm not going to push you. I'm not going to beg. I, well, I think it's because 
of the fact that a lot of it, the area that I'm now in currently, it's not really known for gals that are like me to work in this type of profession. And so it's a little different for that to be a thing and to have people know about my past or where I came from or some of the issues that we've seen at work, they're going to see, ah, well, this is why she shouldn't be in fire. Well, that's in your head. And that's the stigma that we're trying to kill, right? That's the idea in your head that you had. Mm -hmm. You can change that at any moment. Trying. You we'll are. See. You are. You can change that at any moment by saying, fuck you in what you think I should or should not be doing. I'm going to do what is, you're fine. It's okay. It's all right. Go ahead. Open up your, she's like, I got to drink more. Um, you can kill that stigma whenever and however you want. You just mm -hmm. got to start. You just got to start doing it. It is not the golden rule. It is not the iron rule. It is literally just an opinion that came from somewhere we don't know but people just started following for whatever reason and it's a yeah. bullshit opinion in my opinion so we're gonna kill it it's as simple as that just start when you start sharing all this shit and and the, here's the thing that i want to like just make a point here when you start sharing the stuff that you share on your social media when you go live and you start talking about stuff um are you getting that hate you thought you would get? Um, I get I get bits and pieces, but a lot of the positivity will outweigh any of the negative. Weird. So odd. Yeah, weird. Odd. There's a it's lot like, of people out there that want to talk about it, and they can't because they're built like you, me. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's like somebody said that before. Yeah, weird. Odd. I don't stuff know who and said things. It. I like stuff and things. <laughs> I mean, things and stuff. Things and stuff. Things and stuff. You can't say stuff and things because it sounds like you're stuff and things. Yeah, but that's like what I'm known for. Weird, odd stuff and things. Yeah, I know. Just stuff and <laughs> things just sounds so... Anyway. Y'all, we are going to go on a bunch of little bunny trail moments and squirrel moments here. If you have not had a sat down with a conversation with me and Lauren or oh, saw one God. of our lives together, uh, oh, we don't we don't have to worry about being banned this time, which is awesome. Yes, yes, we don't. We can yeah. And it's always you that gets banned. It's no, it's never me. And I, uh, there's times where I feel like I'm it, worse than you are. You are. <laughs> I swear it's because of your tits. It's it has to be. Maybe, maybe, but half the time, in I'm like in a fire t-shirt, ball cap, and like, yeah, but you have tits. True. I don't. Reason of deduction. It's just deductive reasoning. Yeah. It's got to be true, right? I don't know. I feel like a there's a lot of <laughs> men out there now on TikTok that are really attracting a lot of followers because they're guys and talking about emotions and things like that. Like you. Weird. Yeah, odd. but I'm not attracting a lot of people. That's weird. Odd. You do more thirst traps. That has nothing to do with mental health. Absolutely, it does. For <laughs> for them, for everybody else. <laughs> anyway, back on track. Jesus Christ, back on track. Everyone's going to be like, "What the hell am I listening to? What are they talking about? I don't understand." You did not want to come on the show. I want to ask now, and we talked about why you didn't want to come on the show because you had this idea that if you did, you know, you just. You, People in your area, the, the people you work with are going to give you shit or whatever the case may be. Why now, though? How do I explain this? With words. I moved to a different state. Fuck off. <laughs> 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 I moved to a different state and nobody knew me. And it was easy to create kind of my own... Like I got to pick and choose things out of my past that would almost like perceive me as not having issues or having problems that could fall into 
work related situations uh, due to certain calls or anything like that. So, and I think that there's been a few people that I work with that have been on my lives on TikTok when I'm talking about these types of situations. And they're like, why haven't you said anything? Like, why haven't you opened up? This is what we need. In fact, one of my really close friends, his name is Todd. He's been trying to work something in to change things in the forest service. And he, he loves your podcast. He says that he listens to him and whatnot, especially when he's on fires. Cause oh, that's he's, awesome. yeah, he's a battalion chief. So he was like, you need to do it. Like you need to, you need to start it. And I was like, why don't you go to it? He's like, I wasn't invited. And I was like, I could tell him. Uh, he Todd, consider to yourself you. invited. <laughs> Todd, if you're listening, which I know you are, because she just said you listen to the podcast, and it's her episode, so I know you're going to be listening. Todd, you're fucking invited, bro. Just get in contact with me. Yeah, he's he's a really good guy. He's he's seen a lot. He's but he he was one of the initial people, along with one of my other partners that I was really close to. He was like, "You need to start talking about this because there's so many people," and he's he's an older guy. Um, he helped train me in structure side when I I thought I wanted to do that. <laughs> and I did that for two years and yeah, so that's what kind of initiated it and to kind of share the background I came from and letting people know that like, it doesn't matter your background, you're able to be a better person in the future right. and help. So it sounds like it took it took a little bit of a push from people that you trust. Everyone, yes. You mentioned two people specifically, but and you sure. know, fuck the guy that actually invited you to start doing it. Well, uh, you but, did you know, too, but you, know, you knew whatever. when not to push. Well, yeah, well because I know how it feels they to don't. be pushed. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's that's different. Uh, perks of doing a lot of research on mental health and everything is, yes. you know, you, you can hear, you can recognize the, the signs and the sentences and the words that people use when you're like, okay, maybe I'll just back off a little bit. Well, I'm glad you finally did mm -hmm. decide to come on the show. I know you were pushing. It, it was stages. It was stages. Yeah. First, it was an absolute no. Then it was... Okay. I'll do it if I do it with my sister. Yep. Then it was, I'm not sure if I'm ready to do it yet. And then finally, finally, you messaged me. You're like, hey, do you still want to do the podcast with me? And I was just like, I better fucking say yes right now because she's going to change your mind. So that's <laughs> I was problem, just like, And that's probably yes. another reason why you're doing it in your truck because you're like, oh, I don't know if this is going to happen again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like I was like, I might, I might be like, Hey, I'm gonna have to push back. So I came up and then you're going to be like, you know what? Second thought. I'm like, Fuck, I missed it. So right. I'm glad I got to catch you, but well, that's awesome that you find, like I said, it's awesome that you're finally here. I, I told you at the beginning, I think that you can be somebody that starts making that change. You can, it, it's hard to be a pioneer in an idea, right? It is. I've learned that. I've learned that. Now, talking about mental health openly, uh, as, as a male or whatever, I'm not a pioneer in that in any way, shape or form. I, I am not, I'm not the first person to do this in any way, shape or form. There's a lot of people out there that are, you know, a lot of self help people, a lot of people recognizing that depression, anxiety, PTSD, all these things need to be taken care of, especially within the military realm and everything else. Now, what I noticed, though, was there's a little bit of a lack of talking about it within first responder realm. Uh, mm -hmm. We we almost got pushed. I wouldn't say we got pushed to the side, but we definitely I'll got. Say it. It, we got we got forgot about a little bit with uh, the military side of it. Now, this is not me dogging on the military side of it at all. I want to make it abundantly fucking clear because I've had somebody come at me saying, "How how 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 come you're dogging on the military in the twenty two a day and you know, the PTSD is real. And I'm like, I'm not saying it wasn't. I'm, it's, it's very important. 
All I was saying is because it became such a popular thing, first responders kind of got forgot about when it came to PTSD, depression, anxiety, the suicide rate, uh, the mental health disease rate and all that other stuff. We, we kind of got we kind of got forgot about a little bit. And it's true. We did. Unless you're in the service, nobody else was talking about it. No, nobody. There wasn't a there's no there's there's no uh, 22 a day type anything for first responders. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's this there, there's nothing like that. Now, are those things are the, is that awareness good for the military? Absolutely it is. I've had plenty of conversations with military personnel that acknowledge this. They've acknowledged that first responders have kind of gotten this. We have an uphill battle. We do. And I figured, why not Why not be the person to start it? That's why I started the podcast. That's why I started the nonprofit. I was just like, you know what? I'll be that person. I'm going to be that person that says, on top of the job, I have a, a life history that has fucked me up. And it fucked me up really bad. And I want to start bringing awareness to the fact that everybody can have PTSD. Everybody can have depression, anxiety. Is it more prevalent within military and first responder and civil service jobs? Absolutely it is. Go look up the numbers. Do your research. I've done it. I Those numbers are scary. So I wanted to start talking about it. And I wanted you to come on to start talking about your aspect because I haven't had a dedicated wildland firefighter on the show before. And we'll call it what it is, a female and a male dominated career. All right. You and have it? I, I thought you've had No, no, no. In the wildland. Oh, okay. I was like I've what? had a I've had female firefighter. Yeah, I've had a female firefighter. She I think was like the fifth or sixth episode. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, Virginia. Yeah. Virginia Kelly. Being yeah, a female I firefighter. That. I'm I'm horrible at coming up with titles for names of the shows. Uh, L C E S. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Nobody's gonna know what that means. No, but you did. Well, well, I do. Yeah, and so I wanted you to come on to to try to help you be that pioneer because i always told you and i did tell you i was like you can be that person to start making a change and not only can you make start making a change for you know your brothers and sisters in the field that you work for but you can be a change for anybody and everybody that listens to your story and realizes that they're not the only ones that go through something Mm -hmm. Uh, so we're gonna dive into you Gonna start pushing this along. We went through everything about how I got you on. Finally, getting you here. Let's uh, let's dive into who you are. And of course, you've heard my question before when I ask where'd you come from and everything else. I'm not talking about, you know, don't 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 give give me a good. Summary. I'm gonna dive in. Take 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 me from baby Lauren all the way up until when she found out she was a real woman up until now. That's gonna be a little difficult just because of memory loss and left side of the brain being damaged. So that's, but that's I'm going to give it my grade A. That Give it your grade A. I'm still going to make fun of you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and you better believe, you better believe <laughs> your missing flight story is coming. Up. Just saying. Shit. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Um, I grew up in a family, uh, well, the numbers kind of varied. It was a family of seven at first, then it was a family of nine. Uh, majority of us were adopted and fostered. I've gotten so, I've gotten so used to telling this story and how I normally would that Mm -hmm. I have to kind of pull back. I. My mother and father, my, my father is my stepdad, um, but he's my father. He adopted us at a young age. My mother, we were birthed from her and stuff. And then I have other brothers and sisters that are half along with foster. Um, we're an interracial family. And I grew up with a 
seizure disorder for temporal lobe seizures and autism. Had grand mals when I was really young uh, due to medication that I was put on because I was a very hyperactive child. And I was very go, go, go all the time, spastic, jumping off walls, you know, typical kid. And my twin sister was, you know, she was like the cautious one. She was like, ah, I'm going to let you try it first. And, and then if that hill looks okay, I may go down it. Well, that's, that's kind of how we grew up. Later on in life, my mother was, uh, she was a good mom. But then she wasn't. Okay. And once it, it took it took a team of doctors. I'm gonna be bouncing around here because I kind of talk fine. as it comes. That's it fine. took a team of doctors with me in a psychiatric ward at the age of eleven to almost hospitalize her because they were charging her with Munchausen by proxy. Oh, wow. So all the doctors took me off, all medications, seizures, everything. I was on Depakote, Risperdal, I'll, you name it, I've probably been on it. Right. Along with several of my other sisters, brothers and sisters. Some of which we had to wean off because their addiction was so bad. Right. But once that was stopped, I started to grow into my own person. And by this time, I was about 13, 14 years old. Mm -hmm. But I still was like socially awkward, very didn't know how to react to certain situations, didn't show facial expressions or showed too many at times. And I decided that I wanted to try and become a police officer to help prevent some kids from going through some of the similar situations. Went through that and was like, you know what? <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> and that's when I went into fire and I fell in love with it. I wanted to do structure. It was like the goal to do structure fire in California. Mm -hmm. And I did wildland. Oh no, I'd never change it. Never, ever, ever. Okay. There's your, there's your brief history. <laughs> wow. I mean, your summary of your life took just about four minutes. Yeah. You that's that, that's that quick anxiety talk. <laughs> yeah. And when you've heard the show, mm -hmm. and you know, it's coming. What do you want to know? <laughs> we're going to dive a little bit more into your past. Like, okay. I really do appreciate you sharing the stuff that you did, right? It's very hard to even going through a rough time when you're a child and the things that affected us are hard to deal with at times. And a lot of the times when we do start dealing with them, we're not talking to friends and family. We're definitely not fucking sharing them on our on a podcast. We're talking to therapists and psychiatrists and trying to overcome the things that happened to us, the, the traumas, the things that shaped us. And we know we're unhealthy. And the fact that you're able to even give us a small summary of all that is huge. It's a big step forward in you not allowing the past to dictate or have power over your here and now. But I want to I want to dive back a little bit. And when I remember the first time you said you were adopted, it didn't make sense to me. Right. Because. When, when I hear adoption, I hear there is no biological parents involved in any way, shape, or form. But your mother was your biological mother. That was the story I was able to build. Right. And you had foster brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. Right. But you technically cannot be considered a foster kid because you were still no. with your biological mother. No. All right. I want to ask, did you ever reach out or know who your biological father was? We did. We did. Jamie and I both did. Uh, Jamie had her daughter, and we needed to know medical background on our 
biological father. And so we started researching and found his name called the last known address. Mm -hmm. And um, a woman picked up and had said, you know, she was she was flabbergasted because she knew of us. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, it was my bio person's wife, okay. ex-wife, which also had two sons, Adam and Alex. Your half brothers. Yes. Okay. We cool. found this out pretty pretty late on, and she she let us know that uh, our father was a schizophrenic and was probably dead somewhere like the last time that they heard of him was you know he was trying to run away from the cops because he tried to sacrifice his son because he had a episode oh, wow oh yeah wow. <laughs> so we weren't too pleased to hear that you know there's a potential for schizo mm -hmm. in the family so we've never met him We've never had really any desire to meet him because mm -hmm. our father that raised us, oh God, he's amazing. He has his own problems just like the rest of us. He's also mm -hmm. a police officer, correctional officer, let me rephrase. And yeah, he works with juveniles to help mm -hmm. kind of make sure they don't go down that path. Hence where the foster kids came into play. All right. So you, you never had... Any type of relationship with your biological father. Yep. When did when did your father? We're just going to call him your father. When did he come into your life? Was it like, like at what stage of life did that happen? I want to say that we were probably like two years old. Oh, okay. So you don't even really remember a time when he wasn't there. Yes. Okay. Well, that's awesome. That's awesome yes. of him that he stepped up to do that and that he continues to do that. That's, yes. I mean, that says a lot about any person willing to take on somebody else's kids and then continue to take on more kids to try to help them, you know, be raised in mm -hmm. a healthy way. You, you mentioned that growing up, your mother had some psychological issues and was almost having her children she she was exposing him to Munchausen syndrome. For anybody that doesn't know what Munchausen syndrome is, it's when a this is a, a very general summary. It's mm -hmm. when a caregiver, be it a parent or anybody that's a caregiver, convinces the person that they are caregiving that there are things wrong with them that aren't actually wrong with them. They convince them all the way up such to a point that that person believes it wholeheartedly and it takes an extreme intervention to reverse those ideas within the person that those things are being told to it takes mm -hmm. an extreme intervention so basically the reason why they do this is a bit of narcissism on the part that's actually causing the months out this person either wants them to be completely wants the person they're taking care of to be completely dependent on them so they feel some type of worth. Uh, there's a bunch of different theories and studies as to why some people will expose the people they're caring to to this. Uh, but it is extremely related to a, a source of narcissism, a source mm -hmm. of putting their value within the person that they're taking care of. And they don't want that to run away from them. So they convince the person that they're taking care of that they need to be taken care of by them and by only them. They're the only ones that understand them. They're the only ones that can make sure that they're okay. There's a movie. I, I forget what it's called. Um, it's, it's about a girl who goes through Munchausen syndrome. I forget. Do you remember the name of it? I just watched it. Um, I want to Google it. I'm going to Google it. Go Keep ahead talking. and Google it. Yeah. So there's a movie that actually explains it. You can kind of see it's a very famous story too, where the, the girl that was being taken care of by her mother that was getting exposed to his Munchausen, mm -hmm. she actually finally realizes that she doesn't have all these things wrong with them and actually snaps and ends up, if I remember correctly, ends up, uh, 
we'll say dispatching her mother uh and and fighting back and it, it's it's a pretty scary tale and the act the act there you go so what happens is she she ends up uh killing her mother and she she gets off with a pretty light sentence because she was able to prove that her mother was exposing her to munch up and and yeah. she was being affected by that so she actually got a pretty light sentence because they considered it a form of self defense and she's perfectly okay tell this day being yeah. in jail yeah she's perfectly she's fine with like, it she's like she's like this is better than anything i ever had before yeah right. she's she has more freedom in jail she feels like she has more freedom in jail than she ever did being under the scrutiny and care in quotation our, marks care our, of her our case was not i don't know i see i see that that movie and what hollywood has kind of done to it and i i I almost like downplay our situation because we're always doing that constant comparison, like whose is worse. Mm-hmm. Well, um, nobody's nobody's worse or better and indifferent. It's just well different. Yeah, I I also didn't kill my parents, so <laughs> it's you a know. different situation. It's a different situation. But no, I similar to her. I I was I had a grand mal seizure. Um, I was taking Melaril at a very young age, and that mixed with chicken pox led to a febrile seizure Mm -hmm. which then was treated with epilepsy medication to continue on with the seizures and help with them but the problem with that was that if somebody does not naturally have like seizures or anything like that taking those medications well, butrin was one of them, can cause seizures. Correct. So I had grand mal seizures. Uh, the EEGs that were done on me were I was having 100 plus seizures a day. Uh, when I did have my first grand mal, my dad didn't know what was going on. I was in third grade and I just like fell in the driveway. I don't remember. This was just what was told to me soiled myself and um couldn't talk was slurring was almost like i was drunk Mm -hmm. and next thing i remember was waking up in the hospital i had ivs everywhere these things on my head you know the 12 lead and i had to go to the bathroom my dad picked me up like sat me up and i went to get out of the hospital bed and I was using my arms, but my legs didn't work. Oh, wow. So I didn't get function. I didn't learn how to rewalk until probably about six, seven months later. Oh. Something with the drugs that I was being given and with what happened with my brain just caused me to become essentially a newborn child. Right. So, and that whole scenario happened to me twice. Once in third grade, and then I think I was in fourth or fifth when the second when the second scenario happened. During all this, your father, he was unaware of what your mother was doing? Yes. He was working. Okay. My, my mother was, she was a firefighter. She was also a police officer. Um, that's how my dad and her met was through the jails. Okay. And she decided to be a stay-at-home parent, especially with all the kids that minus us that mm-hmm. they were deciding to foster and help out. And eventually, I think that it became too much for her. And when the kids started growing up, we, w- we were no longer needing her. We were coming into our own person and therefore her job was done. And I think her sacrificing her career to do that for us. And now we were growing up and kind of venturing off. She was like, oh no, can't have that. 
no, 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 no. Right. You guys have disabilities. You're all you other kids. Your parents were drug addicts. And some of these kids, they did legitimately have major issues. Right. But it wasn't something that continuously needed numerous of different medications. I mean, to the point where we were going to Tijuana to receive some of these medications. Ah. Uh, so she uh, was, she, she, she definitely thought about what she was doing. Yeah. Okay. When did, uh, when did your father, let me, let me go back a little bit. When did you become aware of what was happening? And when but, you did, what, what was the response you had to what was going on? In the hospital, the, the brief time that I mentioned, uh, when they took me, when I was in the psych ward mm -hmm. and my mom had told me the whole reason why I went there in the first place was that I was essentially, I had been hospitalized in a psychiatric ward uh, about four or five times mm -hmm. because I got introduced to the con concept of God, Jesus, all those things. Well, mm -hmm. I wanted to meet him. <laughs> okay. And they said, no, you can't do that. The only way that that happens is if you die. So I would constantly, as a kid, try and walk out in front of a bus or something along those lines. Would well, you? No, uh, this is interesting. Would you say, because, you know, we hear people having suicidal ideations, right? But usually it's because they, the, the idea is that they feel like their life is so bad that they just don't want to be here anymore or anything like that. Would you? This is a really interesting point that I want to ask. Would you consider the fact that you were having these ideations, not necessarily because you thought you were having a bad life, but because of maybe the brain issues and the brain damage that you were having? It wasn't necessarily, <laughs> it wasn't necessarily a uh, cognitive thought of my life sucks. I want to end my life, whatever, but more of like, I'm just curious. And so, Without it thinking was. rationally, you know, you're obviously not thinking rationally. You've had these, these seizures. You're being, you know, given these medications that are altering your brain in a horrible way. And now you're, you, you don't think of death as this end all be all. You're just thinking of it as, oh, I want to meet Jesus. <laughs> Essentially, yeah. I, I, I laugh at that thinking about it now because that was the, brain thought that I had I was like you know everything that we were taught and everything that uh, my mind went one direction god this this person sounds awesome I would have really dig to meet this person mm -hmm. and that's all I thought that's it's, and that's a very interesting thing because we don't hear we don't hear that idea of why people have these type of ideations we don't hear that it's just I mean, usually it's because they're having a hard life or they're associating it with, you know, something bad that happened to them or, you know, there's, there's all these things. It's very rare that you hear, oh, no, I just, I wanted to kill myself because I wanted to meet Jesus. It, there's, there's really nothing more to it. it. It wasn't, I mean, for all you could have thought was, all right, I met him and then you'd be able to come back. You know, you, you, didn't, well, you weren't able to think past that. Well, and that was kind of the concept that I was fed, essentially, because, God was somebody that was able to, you know, make fish out of nothing and bring back somebody's sight, all these, all these different things. And so I was like, well, he can bring back the dead too. Right. That's, that's, but, that, that's very interesting. It's very interesting to hear that. Um, thank you for sharing. Cause that's something that I'm not even, I, I, I haven't met somebody that that's like, no, let me rephrase. I've had, patients through my career that have thought process like that obviously they're having some mental health issues and they're not necessarily schizophrenia thinking, right they're not necessarily thinking rationally right yeah. they think well if i die i can come back and it's like oh, death is pretty permanent uh, <laughs> <laughs> last i checked um, to, to an so, eight year old or 11 year old though right. it's just like reset in a video game right 
So you, you, you've been hospitalized in the psych ward because of these ideas that you're having. Obviously, you're not thinking correctly. And you said it wasn't until like your third or fourth time that when I was 11 became, years old, when you became aware of what was happening and what your mother was doing. Well, my mother told me that I needed to tell the hospital because our insurance couldn't afford it and we couldn't get the proper medications for me that I needed to tell them that I was suicidal and I wanted to hurt me and other people in my family. Literally, I remember sitting on the hospital bed waiting for them to come in and she's telling me like, no, you need to say this. If you don't say this, you're not going to get the help that you need. You want to be normal, right? You want to be in school with the other kids. And I was like, well, yeah, you know? Mm -hmm. And she was like, then you need to say this. So when the doctors did finally come in, and this was during the process of admission, mm -hmm. she's talking. She is doing majority of the talking. And I remember this doctor, his name was Dr. Shu. He's listening to my mom and he's looking at me a majority of the time. And I'm just kind of sitting there and I'm like, like completely calm. Nothing's really going through my brain. And then he's like, do you feel like hurting your, you know, your brothers and sisters? And I was like, well, when they take my video games, yeah. Assholes, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> like what the fuck? Like any normal other, like yeah, any other normal, any kid, normal right? kid. And mom interjects again. And eventually I'm hospitalized. Well, the doctors decide to take me off every single medication that I was on because they wanted to do an EEG to register what the seizures were doing. Get a baseline. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They started to decrease. And I was in there for three weeks. And somehow, some way, my mom and dad showed up one day. And I remember because I was right in the middle of class. And it was right after an, an Another patient there had gotten in a fist fight with another kid because I took their seat. <laughs> Happens. Mm -hmm. And the doctor sat me down and, you know, had asked, you know, why, why were you in the middle of that? And I was like, I was just sitting down. Like they told me to get up. I said, no. And they started saying, you're manipulating the situation, like what you did and how you played. And I was like, I didn't mean to, like, that's not what my intention. And he's, then they went into, does your mom tell you like what you do when you have seizures? And I was like, well, yeah, I don't remember. Them. So yeah, she tells me how I act and what I do and whatnot. And that's when they started to link together because I was not showing any signs of seizing nothing like that. I was becoming a perfectly normal kid. Right. And they actually tried to arrest my mother on the spot and send her up to her floor. <laughs> oh, it's like another psychiatric. Ward. Yeah. <laughs> the okay. adult ward. After that, CPS was involved in our life numerous of times. We had counselors, people all the time at our house. And I never took my medicine after that. And that's when I started to regain everything. How did that so, make you feel when you realized that this is what your mother was doing to you? I hate her. I absolutely, without a doubt, hate her. There, there's a special place in jail for her. And even, even when, because we've had that conversation with my twin where she sees a different side of it, but you always got to keep one kid to help. Right. <laughs> and she was right about something, though. She did say, I think you remember the statement is 
we wouldn't be the women that we are without her doing everything. And she's right. Right. She that is absolutely true. is right. Well, I mean, but that's, that's true for, you can say that for anybody that was in your life growing up, helping you grow. You wouldn't be the women you are today without your father. You wouldn't be the women mm-hmm. you are today without the situations that you've gone through. It's, it's, it's a very general statement that can be true to a lot of other things. So yes, she is right in that. However, do you sometimes wonder the kind of person you would have been had you not had to go through all that? No. You've never you've never wondered what you would have turned out like, what you would have been like, not having the uh, the TBI. Well, it's not even a traumatic brain injury; it's a medic medicated yeah. brain injury. Like you, you've never thought like, had I not gone through the shit my mother put me through. Where would I be at in life? Who else could I have been? No. No? That's fair. Uh, It's just a question. No, and the reason why is because I don't think I have the capability of thinking that way. Like, what what if? Right. Now I do, but when it comes to childhood and stuff, I don't remember enough of it to regret it. Okay. The, the portions that you've heard are the stuff that I've gotten back. Now, I do remember situations where my mom had lost her shit and we're hiding, we're having to hide all our brothers and sisters in the closet because she's coming at us with belts, uh, scissors, oh, cutting shit. our hairs off, uh, things like that, where she was just in a rage saying CPS is going to come get you you all because she used to use that fear especially with our brothers and sisters Mm -hmm. and it came to a point one day three times where jamie would we hid in the closet and i would help pass the kids out the window to the driveway to load up in the car to leave so it's gotten to that quite a few times wow i you know obviously you gave us your your opinion on your mother now uh, yeah you, you hate her uh, yeah oh yeah she's, she's a done, bitch <laughs> for what she's done and everything <laughs> else and obviously there's gonna be you know not one person's idea of someone's gonna be shared with everybody obviously you oh, no. and your sister have a different idea of her um <sighs> yeah i remember uh, conversation something to the effect of she did the best she could with what she had i remember that yeah. i remember that uh being said but in my head and in my opinion um i don't think that's a good enough excuse i really don't i uh, i think that once you become aware of something that you're doing you have a choice now to mm-hmm. you have a choice to change it and now I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent versed in people that try to create Munchausen syndrome. I don't know what their psychological state of mind is. So I, I have to be very careful and give my opinion on that. But I think there is some type of awareness of what they're doing and the fact that they continue to choose to do it. Uh, does not make them good people. It does not her mother was people. the same way towards her. Okay. So it, it 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 was almost as if it was created. And Jamie and I both, because we were the oldest, right? Uh, we both promised one another that we would never become that to our kids Mm -hmm. and we would never that's why we had that saying lock it up because we had to keep the kids quiet too Mm -hmm. when we were trying to exit the house or get away from the situation and then it started to play into the career that we're in and it was easy it was already built when when you when you went through this you know Obviously, there's things starting to happen now. Things are starting to change. 
uh, what was school life for you? What was what was that life like for you? You know, interacting with other kids that that wasn't that weren't going through what your family was going through, obviously. So what was it like for you? What, what, did you ever compare yourself to other children once you figured this all oh, out? Yeah. You... All the time. That's so where. What, what was school life like for you growing up, like high school and stuff? How how did how did that all I play was, out? I, I was constantly in the special ed class. Mm hmm. And this is where the whole term, you want to be normal, right, came into play. That's why I said it. It was, I was just known as the kid that was in special ed. And we had a twin sister. She got an award for taking care of us, like literally presented at school. Yeah. And it created a bit of almost animosity at times towards her mm -hmm. because she was known as like kind of the person that she did her best and she, but we weren't given that option. So that, that sucked. But once I grew out of that phase and I started going through high school, Oh uh, yeah, I became a little goth kid because they were weird. <laughs> and <laughs> Nice. I, I cut off the back of my head, shaved it, spiked it, fishnets, the whole nine yards. <laughs> Hey, I wore fishnets too in high school, believe it or not. <laughs> Studded belt. Uh, I, I wore that too. Got in fights. <coughs> uh, it was actually pretty brilliant too because I did get in one fight and then Jamie got in another fight and they confused because we were twins my record with hers. <laughs> so she got my mandatory anger management and... <laughs> Oh, nice. <laughs> All that fun jazz. <laughs> so I was like, ah, thanks, sis. Way to, way to take one for the team again. <laughs> once you, once you finished high school and everything, what, what kind of, what were you thinking of wanting to do as you're growing up? You know, you, you've dealt with all this shit in your life. You're going through all this stuff. You're finally realizing, Hey, I am not broken. I'm, I was just being manipulated. Um, so now you're starting to become more aware of who and what you want to be for you. Mm -hmm. What, where were you starting to think? What were you starting to think for your life? What did you want to do? I wanted to go into the military okay. right away. Why didn't you? Uh, my mother came to my recruiter and gave her all my medical records. No. Yeah. I wanted I to be Marine. I, I, I don't want to pass judgment, but your mother sounds like a fucking bitch. Oh, dude, she's a cunt. I'll say it. Yeah. She's 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 not a nice person. So she was even still trying to control you even after everything. She was still trying to have some sort of control, trying to keep you from leaving. Yeah. Yeah. When did you start cutting ties? Oh, God. 22. 22 wow. years old. It took you a while. Yeah. Took you a while. To mom. You okay. know? I mean, despite everything, she was your mom. Right. Well, now, obviously, you, you, you realize it's okay to cut toxic people out of your life, no matter who they are. I haven't spoken to her, I want to say, seven years, eight years. That's okay. There's nothing I wrong with I think the that. last time that I did speak to her was I just screamed at her and I yelled at her and told her all the bad shit she did. And she said she was sorry. Mm -hmm. And that was the end of that conversation. She she did try and show up to a baby shower, interact when I had mine. No, she was uh, escorted or well told she could not enter and in that baby shower, that event and whatnot. But yeah, no, she has she has no idea from I mean, my sister still talks to her, mm -hmm. but 
<laughs> even even Jamie at times is like, oh, dude, I'm going to need a lot more liquor to deal with this. Yeah. Well, after the military incident, you weren't able to do that. What, what, what did that push you towards? Police. Police. And, and the reason was to help other children like yourself it was. growing up. Yeah. And what, what happened with that? My recruiter told me that I had the capability of recognizing when something was wrong mm -hmm. without really making a big scene about it. And she recommended law enforcement. Okay. I, I tried that, you know, it was something that, but I just, I had a problem <laughs> with, the high top socks and the teardrop tattoo down the face in the alleyway of, hey, dude, are you all right? Like, are you good? You're safe? Mm -hmm. Versus, listen here, Mope, what the fuck are you doing here? Right. So I figured, I was like, okay, that ain't gonna work. <laughs> so so you, you, you recognize that your uh, people skills probably wouldn't have been up to par to be. No, they wouldn't. Uh, yeah. I, I I can't do it. <laughs> I well, will fully I mean, admit I can't do it. Hey, that's that's cool. So obviously that didn't work out. How mm -hmm. did were you ever a police officer? No, no, never became one. Never nope. became one. So when you figured this out that you're like, okay, maybe police is not for me. Firefighting, uh, I think you said was next, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I actually I went through a phase where I didn't know what I wanted to do. And it came to the point where I went in a down rolled spiral, spiral, uh, spiral, and spiral. <laughs> words are hardest. Yeah. And, um, I was getting into fights. I was angry and I actually got into a fist fight with a gentleman on a military base. And it came to the point where my dad had coordinated with one of the deputies to arrest me and get my shit together. They, they had me convinced that I was going for a grand theft auto. And oh, wow. well, I stole my parents' car. <laughs> you took it without asking. I th th okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So they had you convinced. They did. They had me convinced that I was, and that I was going to be punished for assaulting the gentleman uh, on the military base. All right. He wasn't pressing charges. I later found out. Uh, he didn't want his buddies to find out. That he got in a fight with a chick. Yeah. And lost. Uh, no, I lost. <laughs> I lost. I was trying. I was giving you an out, Lauren. It's I was all giving right. you an it's out. Right, man. <laughs> um. Okay. So this happens. Like, where does where does fire come? From? Where like to me that would be like, all right. Well, if the cops were nice and they treated like they they helped teach me a lesson, and everything that to me that would reinforce wanting to be a cop. Uh, but it Jamie was in didn't. fire. Okay. Jamie was a firefighter. She was going time. through the fire academy and she was trying to help me. Mm -hmm. And she was like, just try it. Just go, go to the college, do the paid call firefighter academy. Mm -hmm. And I was like, fuck man, college. Okay. <laughs> so I did. Mm -hmm. And I started falling in love with it. Then I took some wildland classes. She was a wildland firefighter with the U S forest service at the time. And that's how it progressed. And I didn't stop after that. Awesome. When you were going through yeah. the academy and you started getting your training and everything, did your past um, and the things you were having to deal with, you know, with your brain and everything, did any of that affect you learning or doing the things you needed to do? Yes. For the job? Yes, absolutely. How did that affect you? Um, when it came to really basic concepts on just even using words, pump to tank, tank to pump, mm -hmm. the concept wasn't connecting with me. They, and 
they had to break it down firefighter level. <laughs> like we, we all hear that saying, but no, they had to break it down beyond that. And then I was able to understand. And now I'm able to explain this to other firefighters. I had a firefighter ask me because he wasn't understanding the mathematical steps on a Mark three pump, um, mm-hmm. pushing water up a hill without blowing your lines. Right. Broke it down to him in the version of a hot wheel car set. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it was a hindrance, but in the long run, it became a beneficial, became a tool. Teaching new, yeah. Became it's, a tool. it's, it took me longer than normal. Mm-hmm. I've most firefighters that have been in this field for 10 years would have progressed up to a higher level, mm-hmm. but because one, I didn't feel I was ready. I, I held myself back more than anything. And people would constantly tell me, no, you need to go. You need to do this. You're ready. And I'm like, nope. I still need to work on this. Mm-hmm. I still need to work on this. Well, you were self-aware enough to know when you were comfortable to move forward and when not to. Yes. I mean, that, that, that says something about you. That's, that's a good trait to have instead of trying to push forward before you're ready, potentially putting yourself and others in a situation that you're not prepared for. Yeah. So that actually, that, that's a good trait to have, if you ask me. Um, was it due to, uh, a learning capability that you had because of yes. what you went through. Sure. But you also recognized it and you didn't ignore it to the point where you're going to, you didn't let it define you and discourage you. If anything, you allowed it to be like, Hey, I'm acknowledging I have this. So because I acknowledge it, I know when I can and cannot be ready for something mm-hmm. to move forward. That's, that's big. That says something about your awareness level of yourself and your commitment to the job and learning the things you need to learn. Just because it takes you a little bit longer, it's not stopping you or deterring you from still going forward and learning. Yeah. That's a good thing. It's a, it's a big thing because you can do that with anything in your life, not just the job. So you get into the fire and you said you did structural for a couple of years. Yeah. Why the, you know what? Get that shit eating grin off. Goddamn thing. <laughs> What do you, why are you smart? Structural, by the way. In my the opinion. Part, the uh, what? I said, in my opinion. <laughs> the, <sighs> the department that I worked for was, there was a lot of good people there. There was a lot of shit people too. Okay. And they have killed it for me. Like, the drama and the politics that go within the structural realm and one another stepping on each other to get to where they need to be was Mm -hmm. so disheartening to me and them using their, this was, this was the huge thing, them using their issues when they went to their person talking about these problems Mm -hmm. against each other. Ah, so they were using their, somebody else's mental health against them to kind of yes. hold them back to move themselves forward. Yeah. Where was your first department? Was it a civil service department or was it just uh yeah, name and pencil you're hired on? Like was your, was your department a union? Was it part of the IAFF? It's partial union and partial not. Okay. And their combination. And the reason why is because when I first got hired on, we were volunteer status. Okay. And that's then we went did. into part-time then we went into full-time okay and it progressed yeah. very quickly all right yeah well during that progression when you go from a volunteer to a paid volunteer is not part of any union no and when you start making those transition the union start and usually it's just a local union before you even apply to be a part of the international uh, before you can even become a civil service uh, mm-hmm. department I personally love civil service departments because there is no out of voice system. There is no 
you're my brother's uncle's friend, you know, it, there's yeah. no buddy system to move forward. I agree. It's, you have to test and show that you're capable before you move forward. That's why I, I love civil service. It, it, it's completely unbiased. It's mm -hmm. studied the hardest and who can do the job the best is going to move forward. Simple yes. as that. And when you're going through these transitions with other departments, especially ones going from volunteer into paid and them going through the uh, heartache and the troubles of creating their command structure now, because they are going to go into a career department. Mm -hmm. it's, there's a lot of ass kicking, a lot of ass, ass kicking, <laughs> a lot of ass kicking and ass kissing. Um, oh yeah. To get those positions, whether or not they are qualified and or deserving of, it's just a matter of whose ass you kiss the most or, you know, how big the bump on the back of your head is from being underneath the desk. It, it, yeah. It's, it's very, very, that's one of the reasons why I left the volunteer department that I was in. Cause it was mm -hmm. just a, it was a popularity contest to see who got promoted. And I was like, wait, hold on. You guys are giving a promotion to somebody that they voted for. Yes. This isn't a union. You're giving him a officer's position within the fire department, like on the line. You're voting him to that point. Like, where's the where's the qualification level here? And to me, that was like, uh, no, nah, I can't. I can't be a part of that because he may have not had the training or he might not be civil and ready. But just because everybody likes him and he put his name in the hat, he's going to get the position. Mm, I can't do that. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of those headaches and stuff going through it. So I can see how that would be. I can see how that would put a bad taste in your mouth for structural side. Had you started in civil service, like in a civil service department already, you know, union and everything. I have a feeling you probably would. Now, don't get me wrong. The politics are still fucking horrible. You get but, politics wherever you go. Right. But with the Forest but service, not, I'm just used to them. Right. Well, it's not even that. When you're in a, a career department uh, that is union, the politics are still there. Don't get me wrong. But there are checks and balances for those politics. It's not a wild west like it is that you were. In, right. Mm -hmm. So if somebody does something fucked off, there are repercussions that you can go and do something about it. Uh, whereas when you don't have that, you can go crying to whoever you want. If you're still yeah. somebody that's causing waves, you're just going to get ignored. I well, and that was the problem with me is that uh, it wasn't so much people getting voted in that didn't deserve to be there or didn't get the position that they deserved. Those people that did get the position, absolutely, yeah, no, they worked their butt off. Mm -hmm. They got their calls and they they did it. Mm -hmm. It was. It was something that was very first said to me on my fire assignment. And it was a warning of, hey, just so I know you're new here. We haven't had a lot of people like you. And I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> and he went further to say, well, we haven't had many females. The females mm -hmm. that we have had were only two prior. And they lasted like three months. because." Right they got washed out because there's a lot of old dogs that don't believe that it's, it's the role of a woman to be in a fire department. A fire I was yeah. like, yeah. And I was like, that's still fucking a thing. <laughs> what? Yeah. And I, it, it's slowly changing now. Like we have in my department, obviously I can't say the department worker, but in my department yeah. we have about seven or eight, and those seven or eight are actually like some of them can outwork half the fucking department. Like, yeah, they can outwork. They're smarter. They know their shit. They, I mean, obviously there's certain things, but like physically speaking, scientifically, physically speaking, men are usually strong. It's just the way it is. It is. And, it I'm is. not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not saying a woman can't be or is has never been. It's just usually. I women. mean, normally when they are, you got to question their testosterone level just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but normally a man has certain 
uh, physical attributes and aspects that make them a little bit better to do the physical parts of the job, right? However, well, yeah, however, it doesn't mean a woman can't do the job. She just might have to do it a little bit differently. There's a thousand ways we're, to skin a cat. Yeah, we're we're taught techniques that will adapt and overcome any type of situation that we're in Exa when exactly. it comes to those things. And that's where I think a lot of people will get confused with the idea of feminism and I'm a chick, hear me roar. Listen here, right. I don't I, I don't care who you are. When you have to take on that that dude in a PCP rage, you you're you're gonna lose. You're yeah. gonna fucking lose, man. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Well, it's not even like, that. It's so there are certain things that this this is my opinion, and I wanna make sure that this everybody knows this is my opinion. It's always a I scary do, topic to talk about. Well, it is, but you know what? That it needs to be talked about. It, these are things that are issues within the firehouse that aren't being explained and talked about, um, and they need to be. Um, I believe women were made differently for a reason. They have, yeah. they were. Not one fucking man in this world, born a man, can birth a child. No, not one. Right. And there's just some things that in this life, a woman can do that a man can't and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. That is okay. There's nothing wrong yeah. with that. Does that mean you shouldn't be able to try? No. I mean, I, if a guy wants to try to birth a child, I don't know how the fuck he's going to do it, but you know, <laughs> uh, it, it's right. It's the thing that, in this career now, none of that matters. It doesn't matter that you were made differently. It doesn't matter that you are physically different. It doesn't matter if you're stronger, smarter, faster. It doesn't, all those things don't fucking matter. What <laughs> matters is, can you do the job when the shit hits the fan? Can I rely on yeah. you to do the best you can and do the job? Are you going to do everything that you can to save my life? Or and vice versa. Can I trust you? I don't care who you are. Black, yellow, green, blue, Hispanic, brown, female, trans, bi, gay. Doesn't fucking matter to me. When the shit hits the fan, can I trust you? that You're going to do everything you can for me like I would for you. It's as yeah. simple as that. And that's the way these jobs are. Military, cop, firefighter, EMT. Can you do the job when the shit hits the fan? That's all that fucking matters. Everything else doesn't matter at that point. Mm -hmm. Nothing else matters. doesn't matter your ideology. That goes along the same lines as, you know, like people ask me, like, how is it being a wildland firefighter when you have to go to the bathroom in the woods? I'm like. I'm still a wildland firefighter that pees in the woods. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's that essentially goes along. The line. I, I, I can't even count how many times I've been asked that question, probably because they're a little crude whatever but it, it's just like man do you squat to take a shit no i just shit in my pants yeah see i i remember that story you told me where <laughs> you were in a structure fire <laughs> oh yeah and you, had to, you had a shitty moment yeah I, i've taken a shit in the structure fire before i mean they weren't going to use that toilet anymore <laughs> 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 i mean We've had people, we, I'm not the only one, I am not the only one that's done it, okay? We've had guys in the middle of a structure fire, literally on the other side of the house, smoky as shit, in their gear, whip out their dick into the toilet, take a piss. It happens. It happens. You know, you everybody to, has those moments, yeah. And it's always so, after you eat, like, a big meal or something, oh, or... Fuck, yeah, that's when the structure fire hits, anyway. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then you gotta go to the bathroom. <laughs> All types of things happen. Um... So you, you're in two years at this apartment and this whole idea of being a female in the fire department gets thrown in your face. Yes. And you are, let's call it what it is. You are a female in a male dominated career mm -hmm. and uh, we, we'll get a little, we'll dive into it just a little bit because I, I, I really don't think it's, it is a topic that needs to be talked about. I just don't. I, I think it's turning, it's getting to a point where it doesn't fucking matter anymore. It doesn't. And it doesn't. So I don't want to give it the credence that a lot of people believe it should have because I don't. 
Uh, I, I, for me, it's if you're a firefighter, you're a firefighter. You know, yeah. Like I said, man, woman, black, green, doesn't matter. If you're a firefighter, you're a firefighter. If you're a cop, you're a cop. Military personnel, military personnel, doesn't matter. So, uh, we'll, we'll, I'm gonna ask this question. We'll get through it real quick. What kind of obstacles do you feel were put in your way, either on purpose and or just because the job is the job, the way the job is? What kind of obstacles do you feel as being a female within the fire service? What kind of things did you have to deal with or would you say you had to deal with because you're a female? Um, I will point out the strongest one that comes to mind right now. And that has been repetitive throughout my career is people are intimidated by me because I have taken that time to relearn, learn everything in a way that I understand it. And now I know it well. And I tend to be a bit, I'm going to say abrasive when it comes to knowledge and people that I don't think belong in the position that they're in. I tend to open my mouth. (laughs) Now, you said intimidated by you. Don't, do you think that intimidation is, is, intimidation's higher because you're a female because look when i meet somebody when i meet somebody that has more knowledge than me or that's a higher rank there's a little bit of intimidation this person has rose the ranks they know they know more than me and everything and it doesn't matter if they're male or female if if they know more i'm a little bit intimidated i don't want to fuck up in front of them you know they 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 have this notoriety do you think Mm -hmm. that intimidation factor is boosted because you're a female in the area that I am currently in, yes. And the only reason why I say that is because it has been told to me by captains and other people that have that confirmed. because you're a female and knows her sh- that knows her shit, they're intimidated by. You. Yeah, because they're a guy and they have a certain way of thinking cuz they're not used to just mainly in this. This is the only area that I've experienced this in. So to me, this is kind of new territory. And I'm like, Oh, wow. I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to expose you to something that you probably weren't ever aware of. It was always there. Uh, well, yeah, I know. Well, I, you I just, don't know. you just now became but, aware of it. Yeah. Uh, it was always there. You just now became aware. Well, and I didn't. There's there's a lot of females out there. No offense. This is not. Sorry to all my chick firefighter first responders, but there are those bitches out there that will take advantage of that. And they will bitch complain and just full send the whole way until they get the position that they need. Oh, or, they, they they play the play the female yeah, card. Yeah, yeah. They play the female card or the and minority what, card. Yeah, and that's what makes it so hard for a lot of these gals in my situation to finally speak up. Because when we do finally say something, it's like whoa, whoa, and it's like no fucker, just like listen. I'm not going to sue you. Just right. Hear me out. Treat me as an equal. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not going to play the card. I'm just wanting you to listen to me as a as an equal. Or yeah, and when you even bring up something like, uh, I feel like I'm being, you know, kind of sidelined, punished essentially for being a chick because there's not that many men that want to work with me mm-hmm. because they're intimidated. Something you just said. Now we want to pull back and pull back the reins and say, oh no, 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 that's not how it is. Uh it is right and that's okay just correct your shit <laughs> right well it, it it's it takes again i what i think it is is the 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 mindset has to change right yeah. um i don't look at you as a female firefighter i look at you as a fucking firefighter simple as that you're, yeah. you're a firefighter you know your shit you've done your training you've been out there you worked your ass off you know how to do the job you're a firefighter. If you're my engine boss, doesn't fucking matter that we're friends. Doesn't fucking matter that you have a vagina. You tell me to do something. I'm going to listen to you. 
You're my boss. Yeah. You're the engine boss. You're, you're in charge of this crew that I'm a part of. That's it. You're going to be treated just like any other fucking engine boss is going to be treated. What the problem is, is that the mindset is too slow to catch up. Uh, too many people are worried about females or minorities in general playing that card. Mm -hmm. What needs to happen for the mindset to change is the people that are playing this card, they need to be fucking washed out. Yeah, they do. But it's, but it's hard to figure out those type of people until it's almost too late. Right. They'll yes. play it. They'll play it just right. So they can get their foot in the door. Once their foot's in the door, they know they're safe. Now I can start playing the card. But when mm -hmm. that starts happening, they don't realize that while they think they're making quote unquote progress for whatever minority they're in, they're actually making it a detriment to the majority of people that w don't want to play that card and they do just want to be looked at as equal. They don't want to be looked at as different. Nobody yeah. wants to be looked at as different within the... I, I don't want to be looked at as a half Hispanic, half white firefighter. I don't want yeah. to be looked at as, as a, a, a firefighter that has a podcast. I don't want to be... No, just, just a fucking firefighter. That's it. It's a career. It's my career. That's all it is. Yeah. Right. And, but we have this issue of tying this subtitle for whatever fucking reason. Right. Like it gives us, like it gives you, like it gives you this extra capability or extra power by saying, Oh, I'm a female firefighter or I'm a gay firefighter or I'm, I'm a black fire. Oh, fuck. I don't give a shit. Can you do the job? Yeah. Because whatever you put in front of a firefighter, I don't fucking care about. Yeah. And the majority, majority of people think like I do, mm -hmm. especially nowadays. Now, there are some old hats, but they're being washed out. They're, they're, they're retiring, not washed out. Well, yeah, they're, 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 they're retiring. Yeah, the, the mindset's changing. You don't need to put anything in front of a firefighter anymore. No, you're, you're, you don't. You, you're just, if you do the job well, you're a firefighter. Simple as that. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm gonna get off my soapbox on that because I'll get pissed. Um, I trust me. I have to. I have to learn myself how to stay out of that realm and start falling down that rabbit hole of feminism and speaking so much about it, even though it's something I feel really strongly about. It it's like one of those things where I'm just like, shut up! All you bitches are giving us a bad name. Mm -hmm. And then I start going down the same rabbit hole, and I'm like, oh, "All right, okay, let's well, it, let's pull this back." Look, if you want to be treated as equal, be treated as equal. Yeah. Stop separating yourself. Stop putting some other title in front of firefighter. Well, and that's equal, why, I, and that's why I made one of the TikToks that I did was I put wildland firefighter, not female wildland firefighter, wildland firefighter. That's it. That's all you are. Yeah. As, and that's what you do for a job. Yeah. Most days. You just happen to have a vagina. That's it. Yeah. Happens. Weird. There's a lot more interesting things that happen on a wildland firefighter after 14 days of no shower that typically wouldn't happen to a male, but, you know, we're totally prepared for that situation. <laughs> Again, many <laughs> females are made differently, but that that, that doesn't... <laughs> That has nothing to do with the job. <laughs> fuck, fuck yes, it does. First of all, <laughs> let me, let me tell the, you the to, not let me the actual job being done. Okay, I know. I was making a sideline joke to try and deter it. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna move on into the the deep shit now because we we went through your past, your fucking tumultuous past. Like holy fuck, and kind of how you got into the fire service. We talked a little bit about the whole female aspect of being a firefighter. And you and I both agree that yeah. that shouldn't even be a thing. You know, you, you started following what makes us fire and me and you got a lot into it because the mental health aspect of everything yes. that we're trying to kill the stigma of talking about. I, I want to start going into this now. We do have to kind of bring up the female aspect of this again just a little bit because That's at the fine. beginning of this, at the beginning of this, you did say something to the effect of, 
You know, you had to be very careful about talking about mental health because you are a female. Mm -hmm. Because there's this stigma that females are more emotional. Females, you know, and if you did speak up, you'd just be playing into that stigma. Yes. Right? And I told you, well, if you don't speak up, you're doing exactly what everybody else does anyway. So you're not really gaining anything by saying nothing. No. So why do you think being a female firefighter makes it even harder to talk about mental health? Because that those are the words you used. It was harder to talk about mental health as a female. I I I, I disagree. I think it's hard to talk about mental health if you're within the civil service at all. Uh, but you had this idea that because you're a female firefighter, it made it a little bit worse. What were your ideas on that? Why would you, why would you say, I what think, would you believe? I, I think it goes hand in hand with male and female. It's harder for males to talk about it because it was built into them that they shouldn't talk about that. That was, They're the man. Mm -hmm. They can't talk about that stuff. That's too emotional. Same concept has now been played into females. If you do talk about that, you're too emotional and you're that typical female. If you're a guy and you talk about that, maybe you shouldn't be doing the job. Right. It's like a catch-22. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to just do with females. It has to do with everything that we were taught was we don't talk about this because if you do, you probably shouldn't, if this is too hard, maybe you should think about a different career. And they talk to you in that monotone, condescending, patronizing. It's okay. I understand. Maybe you should choose a different career. Mm -hmm. That's why. Because essentially, after so many years, you're going to see some fucked up shit. Right. You're going to you're going to have some moments where you're like questioning do should I do this? I I just texted you last fire and I was like, "Fuck, dude. Um yeah, I'm really really thinking about right. <laughs> whether I want to do this anymore." Mm -hmm. And it's just it's one of those things where it's if you talk about it you're that typical person that maybe we should bring into question whether you should be in the position that you're in. Right. Do you, it's hard to, how do you go from, obviously it's the mindset of the higher ups, right? That are yes. questioning this. Have you seen anything in your realm of wildland firefighting? Now I, I do have my wildland shirt and everything I have not been deployed just yet. I've done, you know, small little wildland stuff in the city that I work for and everything. Mm -hmm. But have you seen any type of shift in the mindset of the firefighters around you and the higher ups about talking about when, you know, hey, maybe we need a SISM, a critical incident stress management debrief or something. Are, are, is that being talked about more? Are, are people allowing the firefighters and everything else to kind of express, hey, this kind of fucked me up a little bit. I might need to, might no. need to take a sit back. No. Why do you think that is? Because wildland firefighting is still stuck in that realm of, do you need that? Do you have this? Are you capable of this? We're, we're still stuck in that paramilitary, very are you strong enough to deal with this stage? And there's so many that have young, old, new, that have been, I'm going to say groomed, to believe that that's just not stuff we talk about. And if we do, then maybe it's time for you to move on. Maybe go to, we, no offense. No offense to anybody. Maybe you should go to City Fire. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but it's, that's kind of our, 
<laughs> mentality. And it's a lot of it, a lot of it is within the US Forest Service. Mm-hmm. And a lot of it just isn't a normal thing because we don't deal with the same stressors as far as patients and things like that. But, and that's how a lot of the public sees it. But have you ever been on a fire where, you know, a single dad of four kids just bought a house finally because their mom passed away in a car accident? didn't have any insurance on the house, nothing. And their house is burnt down and he has to try not to cry in front of his kids because everything he was lost was lost that he worked for. Probably not. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had to deal with, you know, just got caught in the smoke of, a really broad open area in a forest and the road was literally right here to deploy and you couldn't even pull out your shelter right here and you died. Right. So, I mean, we're not even given the title as wildland firefighters. When we fill out our applications, it's for forestry technicians. There is no firefighter. There Mm -hmm. is forestry technician. So this is within the U.S. U.S. forestry. Yeah. Hmm. Do you find it more difficult to (sighs) express these concerns and ideas because it is the forestry service and wildland? Fuck yeah. And have you? Okay, so you say fuck yeah. But, so there's this huge shift in structural fire, city fire, that we want our guys to start speaking up, our guys and girls, Mm -hmm. right? We want them to start speaking up because we noticed a trend, should have noticed it fucking a long time ago, but we've noticed a trend that firefighters are killing themselves at a higher rate than ever before. And, you know, like in 2019 alone. More firefighters died via suicide than line of duty. Like, those aren't okay numbers. I don't know what wildland firefighters' numbers are. I don't know. They're not recorded. Exactly. Because they are not considered firefighters, right? So, do you know of or have you done any research as to how a change could be made with all that? So Tom and, and, and I have been talking so, about this. And if you have, and you haven't found anything, have you thought about starting something? What would your ideas be to, to actually start something for that? So you, I'm sorry to interrupt. You said you and Todd were, were talking about this. No, it's okay. Um, we don't know how to go about this. Todd and I have been talking about this on something needs to change. Mm-hmm. Like there's, what can we do? Because once the seasonals go home, that's it. Right. They're no longer a part of the U.S. Forest Service. So their suicides when they come back home and they're now off season are not recorded. We, we can't figure out a way yet. Yet. Mm-hmm. to start putting together an intervention because one, it's the federal government. That's, that's, it's going to take a lot more than two people right. to start changing that. Mm-hmm. And it's actually, gonna, actually all it, all it takes is one to start changing. It, it takes shit. the idea, takes the idea, takes the idea, and then you just start sharing it. And sharing, well, and, and sharing. so that idea has been semi played this year, and now everybody, including myself, are like, "What the fuck?" Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's that ten percent increase raise, 
And that mandatory no overtime, no 21 days, mandatory three days off comes into play. Mm -hmm. That built a whole nother level of stress on firefighters. Financially. Financially. Yeah. And not to mention work environment. I mean, we had this situation. We were working from, you know, eight o'clock in the morning and getting off, mandatory getting off the fire line by 1900. You want to take us off the fire during witching hours? Are you kidding me? Now we have to worry about we're going to go bed down and you know, start taking apart the engine, restocking and doing all this stuff, thinking, oh, shit, we're going to walk into a shit show tomorrow. It's going to mm -hmm. happen tomorrow. Where everything that we did today is completely pointless. On top of, well, we can't do any of that. And now I'm not making enough money for my family at home that is bitching because I'm gone constantly. So mm -hmm. what they were trying to do was... I, I wish I could say it was a good idea. It, it, no, the whole thing sucked. <laughs> the, their whole ideal behind it just God. Do you know where that idea came from? Where their quote unquote uh, solution came from? Did they did they actually get any input from the guys on the line, guys and girls on the line, or was it just all higher ups? Something needs to be done. Let's just do this. So that's where it initiated. And I actually got talked to by a gentleman on this last fire. Um, and he was like, I really need to sit down and talk to you about why you have such an issue with this. And I'm contracting fire at this time. I'm normally mm -hmm. with the U.S. Forest Service. And um, I was like, you're not going to like what I have to say, sir, with all due respect. like. I think your idea is complete shit. And he was like, <laughs> mm -hmm. and so I sat down and I talked to him and he was like, so it's my job to gather information from firefighters on the line of why this is not going to work. I was like, okay, well now you have it. And mm -hmm. he's like, well, what do you think we need to change? And I said, I think that you need to start you need to increase the pay without taking away their pay. Right. And you also need to start implementing constant brief counselors or whatever you guys need to do on the fire line. Or make it mandatory to have an AAR. And in Wildland, that's not, we don't know what an AAR is. For everybody listening, AAR is an after action report. That is uh -huh. basically after all the operation is done or the assigned operations are done for the day and everything, you do an after action report. So these are the actions that are happened. This is the outcome of those actions. And then from there, you can create another uh, action plan, uh, an IAP, incident action plan. So it. <laughs> AARs are very beneficial for the actual objective for the job that you're on. Now, when it comes to the mental health aspect of everything, which she was talking about having a uh, SISM team there, I think mm -hmm. would be, or at least somebody that can put on a SISM team that's available would be a huge thing. Uh, mm -hmm. I even think maybe implementing a peer support network within the wildland group where you send a few of your firefighters and officers in wildland to go get some peer support training. That way, if somebody does need to talk, no, they, they know who they can talk to instead of just yeah. keeping it in. Or even having, you know, people within your crew people that got trained to be there because not everybody's going to go to that tent. You know, no. people are going to see it and say, yeah, uh -uh, I ain't going there. Right. But well, even having people trained within the crew that you're working 
to be able to handle those situations and almost like you know, how we get a line EMT mm-hmm. with us when we're lucky. Same concept. I, I, and I think that's a good thing. I think that's something that, that should be implemented for sure. But it sounds like there's a bigger issue in that to have that happen, the mentality of the people working actually is the largest obstacle that you have to overcome because you can offer these things and you can have that there but like you said somebody might walk by that tent be like i ain't gonna do that Mm -hmm. i mean i i I need to talk but i ain't gonna fucking do that i don't want people seeing me go to that tent talk talk to them like no i don't want that so i think the bigger (sighs) challenge that i think you have is changing the mentality of talking about that's, and that that's comes, the bigger challenge. And that comes in the beginning of training firefighters. Exactly. How many, I, I can't tell you, I literally, well, let me rephrase. I can tell you how much uh, mental health aspect was talked about during my training. And it was literally this. You guys are going to see some fucked up shit. Make sure you guys talk about it to somebody. All right. So the fire tetrahedron. Yep. You're like, okay. So, here's the number on the board. It's posted on this board. Yeah. You, you, if you guys need somebody to talk to, here's the number on the board. And yeah. then they say it once. Or when you get hired on, hey, here's the EAP number if you need it. And then done. Right. Mm-hmm. Now, it's changing within the civil service realm, within the, the structural realm. We are talking about it more. It's becoming more of a thing, especially because the numbers are growing and everything. But it sounds like on this other aspect of firefighting, there's a lot of work that needs to be done with the mental health of the guys that are out there in the forestry service, guys and girls. I keep saying guys. When I say guys, think of it. Uh, I, I do. I don't. I don't differ. Right. I'm not uh, one of, of the firefighter. Yeah, the firefighters out on in, in wildland, and there, there's something that needs to be done. There's a lot of work that needs to be done, especially with the mindset and the culture of what mental health means within yeah. that realm. You know, it, it's starting to change now for first responders. Cop, uh, cops still have a long way to go. Um, oh yeah. Uh, but firefighters, I think, are taking, or the fire service is mm-hmm. taking the lead in trying to get all these changes made, and, and you know, laws passed and everything else. But it sounds like there's some work here that needs to be done within the wildland realm, and to start, it needs to start with. The, a culture shift needs to happen. A culture shift and I- ideology need that shift needs to happen because if it doesn't happen and you continue having these people with the old mentality that don't talk about it, keep your mouth shut. Well, that's killing people and it's killing people in more yeah. ways than one. You're having these people go work, stress the fuck out, wondering when and how much they're going to get paid, wondering when and if they're going to go home. And mm-hmm. They're seeing some really fucked up shit. Uh, they're having, you know, brothers and sisters get hurt or die on the line. And you're giving them nothing to process any of this. And the culture you are pushing towards them is get over it or get off the job. That's the culture yes. you're pushing. And that is the wrong culture because now morale's going to fucking tank. Morale's going to tank. Because you're not giving these guys, you're not allowing them to be validated in what they're feeling. You're, you're, you're going to tell me that if I, if something happens to me, you're going to treat me just like an, a fucking piece of paper. And then the guys that are affected by what happened, you're going to treat them like a piece of paper. Mm-hmm. How the fuck do you think they're going to work for you after that? They're going to feel like you don't give a shit about them. They're expendable. Well, and that's why the wildland firefighting service is suffering so bad, especially this year. We don't have enough people. We just don't. Well, why do you think, why do you think that is? Why do you think that the numbers have dropped for wildland firefighters contract and U S forestry service combined? Why do you think that it's so hard for them to find people to get on that line? Low pay overworked, no capability of knowing how to handle stuff when you go home. 
it's the hurt locker syndrome. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's, that's how I explain it to some of my new firefighters that I teach and whatnot or train is that if you have a family at home and you're finding it difficult to function and get out of that constant stress throughout the whole entire day, throughout the whole entire night, you need to start looking at outreaching to people. Well, you can't do that because it's probably there's no, Well, that there's nobody to reach out to. They don't yeah, provide anything for you guys. No, there is nothing out there for us. Like there, there isn't. Once you're, Unless, once you're done with your season, that's it. Right. And so when you go home, you're like, God, I, I need to hurry up and get back out there. Yes. Right? Cause it, and it's that whole mentality. And, and you know, a lot of structural guys go through it too, is because we operate on this high stress level. 24 seven for an extended period of time. When we go home, you know, they, they say you should switch it off. No, you just shouldn't switch it off. You should find a way to be able to incorporate how you can, uh, manage the stress that you were on, on the job and then start incorporating that with your family life well, and allowing you- and allowing the people in your family knowing where you're at. Right. They, if they know, and they're aware, how about some fucking education for the families too? Hey, yeah, you might Agreed. see this. You might see this when, when, when they come home, if you see this, call this number, reach out to this number, you know, ask them this, talk to them about that. There, there's so much fucking training and everything out there and information that people can utilize. But it's this idea that if you utilize it, you're less than no, fuck you. If I utilize it, I'm going to come back stronger. Well, and all this training came from all these ideas. I believe came from the military. They Mm -hmm. have trainings for, you know, family members that, Hey, if your other half comes home and they're acting this way, or they're doing this, give them some time. If they're going beyond that, you need to contact this. You need to start seeking out these other options and stuff. And those are now the first responder realm is starting to adopt more and more and more of that. Mm-hmm. It's just really fucking slow. It is. And, Too and the reason, slow. Well, it's very slow. And that, like I said, we, we kind of got, we kind of got put on the back burner. We kind of got forgotten about mm-hmm. the first responders. Um, again, not dogging the military for what they did and for how popular it became. It needed to happen. But first responders, we're trying to catch up and yeah. without the help it's fuck fuck it's yeah. hard work i mean it, it, it's essentially like for instance i came home off of a fire assignment and we were just going grocery shopping literally just going grocery shopping the type of grocery shopping i'm used to on the fire line is hurry up and get your shit we need to get to the fire mm-hmm. but we were going down each aisle walking slow and I was getting anxiety from worried about people that are going to come up. What is the fire doing? What is this doing? What is that? Is my house? Okay. It's this address. It's, you know, all these things are my animals. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I had to like pull back and realize, okay, I'm not on the fire line, not on the fire line. I'm not on the fire line. And it got to a point where I'm like, D- are you done? Like, do you need to read every ingredient on the box? And he was like, and I was like, oh. mm-hmm. sorry, sorry. Right. And that's where I say the hurt locker syndrome, because it's literally, there's a portion in that movie where he comes back home and he's walking down the aisle, grocery aisle and he's just looking at everything overwhelmed because he has all these options and right it, he's not focused on the one thing yeah and yeah that, that happens that it's not just that, that happens with a lot of high stress jobs yeah i i'm not just designating it towards wildland but i'm more or less like you know even with city fire you mm-hmm. know Oh fuck! I really hope I don't get a call right now. 
God, I just need to get this. There is a shit ton of people in line. Holy fuck. Yeah, no, it happens all the time. <laughs> like, and then God forbid you go home. And so like for me, the way what happened with me is what I had to learn is I, uh, as a firefighter, you know, we see a problem, we take care of it. It's, it's a yeah. response, automatic response. Yeah. See it, analyze, do take care of the situation. Well, that line of thinking doesn't really work when you have to be empathetic at home. You know, on the fire, on the, on the fire, I don't really have to be empathetic to the problems that happen because usually when there's a fire or when there's a patient, there's steps and processes that we've learned that we know what to do and we do them, we get them done. We don't really have to be mm-hmm. that empathetic. We can turn off the empathy because, well, we have steps and processes that we've been trained on. But when you go yeah. home and you have family life stress, well, when you don't turn that empathy back on. People have a really major fucking issue with it. Yeah. Well, you know, you know, your spouse wants you to be a little well, bit yeah. empathetic to their needs and wants and what's we just them had this. what stresses them. Right? We just had this conversation. Yeah. Right. So you, you want them to be a little bit empathetic and you're just like, empathetic to what? You have a problem. Let's fix it. Like, yeah, but I want you to understand. There's nothing to understand. You have a problem. Let's fix it. And it's like, no, you're not understanding. What it's do you not mean I'm not simple. understanding? There's a fucking problem. Let's fix it. And it, it's it's that line of thinking that causes, and believe it or not, that's why, you know, civil service has a high divorce rate because empathy is really hard. You know, there's something that I, I saw, a, I saw a, a video once and it said, uh, first responders, military personnel are uh, selective psychopaths uh, because oh, we, well, because <laughs> we, we, we can, at the drop of a hat, turn on and off our empathy it's the news reporter right they know when to laugh they know when to you know have that sad look and then they now back to this right and it's like we we can turn on and off our empathy we're we're Mm -hmm. selective psychopaths and when i heard that i was like oh my god like that that that's why we have all these issues and problems at home and that's why we start having all these stresses at home because Nobody's teaching us or telling us how we can mitigate these things. Yes. And that also comes with insecurities that are built with in our families, especially being gone for so long or even structural firefighters. Like you're, you're sleeping at the station and Mm -hmm. you're away from your family. You're not coming home every night. And those insecurities start to build on our family side and our other half side and it's a constant reassurance as soon as you get home which is mentally exhausting because you're already trying to reassure yourself you're doing the right fucking thing Mm -hmm. you made the right call now i have to assure you that everything's okay (laughs) right and it it, it causes a lot of issues causes a lot of problems i i found that Yeah. And I found that I I have to break this habit that I've been telling my new firefighters, like, if you're in a relationship, prepare to be like out of it by the end of season. (laughs) 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 It may or may not be a good thing. I mean, (laughs) one way or another. One way or another. How... You need to be okay with being alone in this field. How do you think you should go about changing the the culture and the mindset and the ideology? What what do you think is a good place to start? At the beginning. At the beginning. At the beginning of training. What does that mean? At the beginning of training. And that goes to that I'm all for hazing a certain amount. (laughs) Let's not call it hazing. Let's call it uh, initiating. I'm all for popping the cherry. <laughs> <laughs> I think that there's certain words, terms, and phrases used during that cherry popping that builds, starts to build that, okay, I cannot say this. Or else Mm -hmm. they're going to think I'm weak sauce. Right. Or I cannot do this. I cannot feel this way. So you you said at the beginning during training and stuff, and that would be great for 
you know, the next generation. I guess my question is more of what can we do to change it now with who's already involved? Your idea will definitely help for future, obviously, right? Because now we're going to instill this idea. Hey, if you have a problem, speak up, talk about it. All that's good. Now, now you're, you're starting to change the culture and it'll get there once all these older hats kind of move out of the way. But what can we do now with the older hats, with the people we have now, with the current ideology? What, what do you think we can do now in getting that mindset to start shifting? We can't. You don't think we can? And no, I don't. Why not? Because it has already been taught to us. And the best thing that we can do is something that we have been taught from the beginning is to build the next firefighter better than you. Mm -hmm. And since we have already been brought into those habits, they're going to be harder for us to break, but hoping that new firefighters and public servant realms see that, Hey, there are some that did change. There are some that did talk about it. We're going to encourage you to continue this. Mm -hmm. I'm going to disagree with you. I'm going to disagree Bye. with you on that. I think you can. I had a you. brilliant speech that I, I, as soon as you said that, I was like, oh, gotcha. No, no. <laughs> I'm going to disagree with you. Uh, the reason being is I don't believe that term that you can't teach an old dog new tricks. I don't believe that. I believe it's harder. Absolutely. Especially when you have to break a habit. Habits mm -hmm. are hard to break. But you can break them. In that you continue to fight against the idea and stigma. You are what would be considered somebody that has is a staple that is set in your career. You've been in it for a while. And you're starting to break the cycle. You're starting to break the idea, the mentality, and talking about it and everything else. Shit, it took me a while just for you to start opening up, uh, to get you to start opening up. But you're starting to do it. And you didn't think you would. I remember <laughs> that you were actually pissed off at me because I convinced you to. Yeah. There was so that moment. If, if you're capable of doing it, even with the ideology that you had, there's a way to get through to these other people that we need to get through to. And to do that is to be persistent and showing that this is a beneficial, beneficial thing. That's mm -hmm. what I try to do with you. I never pushed you. I never pushed you, but what I did do, mm -mm. it was, I was consistent in showing you what I was. Doing. I was consistent in showing you that. It was helping other people. It was helping me. I was consistent in showing you that you're not going to be judged. And if we can continue showing that to people, especially people with the current ideology that is out there, maybe they'll have this aha moment like you did and realize, all right, this is beneficial. You know what? This can potentially save somebody else's life or my own. I don't have to be afraid to talk about it. I don't have to be afraid to say exactly how I feel when I'm feeling. Because when you keep that shit inside and you go home and you don't know how to deal with it, we're losing too many people because we're not giving them the tools to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And if we can it show them that the tools do work, even with established firefighters, People that were taught the old ways are now charging to change. If we can show them that, I think we can make it. I don't think, yes, we still need to start that training at the beginning. When you start that idea at the beginning, absolutely. But I do not believe that we can't change it now. I think we can. I think that we can have those people that 
have the capability and are willing to open up and start talking about these things for future firefighters. I don't think that it will change overnight though. And that's kind of the concept that I'm getting when you ask that question is, can we change it now? No, no, we can't. It's a work in progress. Right. But, but if we get enough people to talk about it, start realizing that there are issues and some of them may not be fire related, No, but (laughs) they may be something that you bring to your work that you don't even realize that you bring to your work. Exactly. Yeah. What are we before we're firefighters? We're human fucking beings that have lives and stresses just like everybody else. Yes. And then you want to throw us into a job that creates more of that stress Mm -hmm. or just adds on. There's shit that we need to take care of. And there's, there's shit that needs to be talked about and people need to be open to hearing it and people need to be open to fucking sharing it. Look, the only way the stigma is going to die is to actually fight against the stigma. The stigma is don't talk about it, right? Don't be, don't be that guy. Don't talk about it. Fuck that stigma. That stigma means I'm going to be just like everybody else. Fuck you if I'm going to be like everybody else. Yeah. And I'm not like I do, else. I do think that it puts a lot of stress on families and whatnot because when we finally do start to open up and start to talk about things i've noticed this recently with mine is that now they're not used to it and now they're like are you okay like do you need to go see somebody do you need to go and it's like yes probably Mm -hmm. well you know i kind of wasn't ready for this what the fuck? <laughs> Squeeze me? Yeah. Well, I mean, it happens. It happens. And whenever and it's going to be, but that again, that's going to be the same type of reaction you're going to get from anybody that you start a new uh, thought process in, right? You've always yeah. acted this way. You've always acted this way. Now you're acting this way. Uh, well, yeah. I'm, I'm acting more healthier now for myself because I want to be healthier for not only myself, but for you so that yeah. I'm here so that I'm not treating you the way I've been treating you and that I can treat myself and everything else in my life better. So yeah, I'm it not, is gonna be different. yeah. Too emotionally shut off. Don't talk. No facial right. expression. Very monotone when it comes to problem situations or very over the top with situations. Yeah, over screaming. the top. Weird, <laughs> odd. Weird. <laughs> Lauren, thank you for kind of throwing us and putting us into that realm and kind of sharing exactly what's, what your perception is of what's going on and what you've been going through in your, you know, section of firefighting, I guess is the best way to put it, your, your area of yeah. firefighting. Um, there is a lot of work to be done. And Mm -hmm. I want to say you doing what you're doing, uh, starting to speak up, starting to speak out and being, you're being, call it what it is. You're being a face for change. You are being a champion for change. And that says a lot about who you are and your character. Now I have been lucky enough to see that process and that growth in you. Uh, I was lucky enough to see you start off with no fuck you, I'm not talking about anything. Um, to now you're saying no fuck everybody else, I need to talk about this. It yeah. Needs to happen. And that is a huge thing because it is people like you that start the conversation that start not allowing other people's perceptions and ideas of these changes that need to be made to affect what you truly think is right. Mm -hmm. People like you that are going to champion that change. You are starting that change by doing this. Well, you you started it first. No. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't start anything first. You are, you're, you're starting a champion of change within your realm, right? For you. And for other wildland firefighters, uh, 
for female firefighters. I hate bringing that up, but you yeah, are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but <laughs> it it is what it is. You are whether it's with liquid courage or not. You are. Oh yeah, no. <laughs> oh yeah, no. We got three here. <laughs> You you are starting you are starting something big, and believe me when I say this, the support you're gonna get once this airs, you you're gonna you're gonna be flabbergasted. <laughs> you're gonna be like, wow, I did not know this many people supported this idea, because not a lot of people want to talk about it. Not a lot of people want to speak up. You're one of those people that are starting to speak up. And that's huge. That's a big thing. Don't take that away from yourself. You. You too. Be prepared to be a poster child. No. Be prepared. No. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to happen. Um, you're, you're doing good things by sharing your story. You're doing good things by sharing the trials that you're having, trying to make a change. You're making the secrets and the silent talks loud, the ones that need to be loud. And that's, that's a good thing. It takes fucking courage to stand up against the people that are telling you to shut up. Mm -hmm. It takes fucking courage to tell them, no, fuck you. This needs to be talked about. I'm tired of seeing people hurt. I'm tired of having these issues. I'm tired of not being taken care of and doing the things that need to be done to be taken care of and you're taking that step by sharing stories by going on live and talking about certain topics at a time like mm -hmm. those are small steps towards the right direction because nobody else is doing it. well i think it's going to take a lot of people within this line of work to continue on making that change and, and hopefully it, it can progress into other fields. Like it will. That's the thing. Intent, it, Jamie. That, that thing, it will. It will. Because there's going to be other firefighters out there that are within your line of work. They're going to hear your story. and They're going to be like, fuck. Okay. I need, I need to back her up. Because why haven't I spoken up about this? Why haven't I? Sh why am I not sharing my story? Why am I not sharing my concerns? If she's willing to do that, let me back her up and do the same thing. Let me do this. Let me do that. I promise you, you can turn this into something huge if you just continue to do it. Just yeah, continue and to I, do it. I, I'm going to try. I just need to figure out the right way to go about it, especially when it comes to this this field, just mm -hmm. because it's so broad that it's well, insane. You, there's a lot to fucking change. Yeah. But you're you're starting where I believe needs to be started. And that is just talking about it. What's the first thing you always have to do when you start trying to change something? Start the conversation. Open up the idea. Well, Somebody that's what you it. did. So I keep your shit up, too. I am going to keep my shit up. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, you know I love you to death. And I think you are doing some amazing things. For me. And I think you are going to make a bigger change than you think. We'll I see. really do. No, I really do. And you know, you have my support 110%. And if there's anything I can do, let me know. Uh, I have no problem being an asshole and sharing my concerns and ideas with people. Neither do I. Well, to a degree. No, I, I have no, all. I have no problem just saying what I need to say. <laughs> right. At times. At times. Me, I, it's all the time. I have no problem. None. Well, so if, if you, if you I, need I something to be said, if you need something to be said that you're not too sure that you want to say it, just call me. I'll be like, hey, look, motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, call uh, Jamie. Yeah. That's, yeah, or call her. Yeah, she's the same way. I, I'm, I'm hoping that this will kind of encourage her to be start that voice. to. Yeah. And I think it would be nice for her to actually talk about this because i think that would be the first step is being able to talk to a friendly face mm -hmm. and oh oh you know it's somebody that 
Are you kidding me? Whatever. Okay. <laughs> so, but no, I appreciate what you're doing. She loves what you're doing too. She just needs to, she's like me. She'll get there. It's like, it's like doing the repeat. It's like we're twins or something. It's fucking weird. Odd. <laughs> <laughs> Um, now the whole process that we started, now you have to start with her. Good luck. <laughs> okay. I can do that. <laughs> you said you said the exact same thing to me about you. Okay. And look where I we're did. at. It yeah. took me a couple it took a few months, but I hey, you're here. Yeah, what has it been like? Oh god, like six months, something like that? Yeah, something like that. Months. Yeah. Yeah. Um I'm gonna move on to something a little bit more lighthearted. Okay. Um, and again, I do want to say thank you for everything you share so far. Uh, social media. What the fuck possessed you to get onto social media, TikTok of all things, and do what you're doing? Uh, can I pee real quick and then get back to you on that? Sure. Okay, <laughs> stand by. You know, you know those moments where you... You've been working like severely, like on a structure fire and or wildland fire, and you've had to pee so bad. Yeah, I saw and you then shaking. You cold bladder. I was like, oh God. Yeah, I saw you shaking. <laughs> um, so what possessed me to get on TikTok and those things? Well, funny story. My <laughs> twin sister was the one that started me on it. I was pregnant and I was mandated no more firefighting. And that was after the Kin Kincaid fire. Yes, I was pregnant when I fought that fire. Had a gender reveal. It was pretty cool. But the doctor mandated me. I cannot leave the house. Like, he called the department everything and was like, she cannot go. She can't even report to the station. She can go to doctor's appointments. <laughs> so you're pretty much put on bed list. Yeah. Okay. Extreme bed rest. Mm -hmm. Fucker. <laughs> Love him, but dear mm -hmm. God. Um, so she was like, here, get on TikTok. I've made some fun TikToks, this, that, and the other. And um, I was like, this is so stupid. I'm never going to do this. I've seen this. Well, I finally did it. And I posted a writ training class that we had. And it was just me, you know. During a scenario, throwing the hose underneath my pack and being lifted through a hole. And that blew up. Like, I had firefighters from Australia, New Zealand saying, what is this tactic? And I actually brought it to the department. And I was like, hey, these guys want to do some trainings with you. Like, can you show them? And they did a Zoom meeting with a New Zealand department and showed them and then it kind of just progressed i saw the wipe wipe and i was like hey let's try that one <laughs> so it was literally because you were getting bored and your yes. sister said hey if you're getting bored try this yes your, your story is not unique a lot of people have told me they got on tiktok just because they were bored and that they were never going to do it and, like I was never gonna do it. I only no. got on to I only got on to promote the podcast. Like I was literally just gonna use it to promote the podcast, and then stuff and things happened, and it became what it, it is did. now. And it's growing, and it's awesome, and I love it because it is helping myself and a lot of other people. Uh, it's mine a, for me. It's become yeah. a form of therapy. It is. It is. It's fun. It's entertaining. It's one of those things and you get a lot of similar similar people that can relate to you on there mm -hmm. and you're just like hey yeah no shit right that did happen been there but um now it's also kind of progressed into the realm of like thirst trap Versus firefighter versus twins versus it's, all that it's, fun stuff. It's evolved into several different things I've seen. Where are you wanting? Because now I see that you're actually doing a little bit something now with your lives. 
you've gone live and now you're discussing some pretty hard topics now. Um, mm -hmm. Or somebody will ask a question and you'll go live specifically to have a conversation about that question and then it goes in and dives into other aspects. Um, is that something that you're wanting to push that forward or are you, or are you enjoying what you're doing with that? I am. Uh, so it's when you when you say that, do you mean like as far as like when it comes to wildland firefighting and things like wildland that and some, of the hard topics. and some of the hard topics that you have brought up and everything? Yeah, that you're starting to have those conversations you said you never were going to have. Yeah. Live. Um, and I, I think it's awesome. I think you should totally continue to do it because, again, just like here on this podcast, you're starting to share a little bit of your story and what you go through and it's helping other people realize that it's okay to share those stories mm -hmm. so are you gonna wh where are you wanting to take this what are you wanting to do with this i want to build a program for wildland firefighters and their families mm -hmm. like interact interact with one another mm -hmm. learn how to re-interact with one another mm -hmm. when they get off the fire line and the best way, the, this is an idea that I had when I was younger. And I haven't, I haven't talked about this to anybody. So you're the first. We're getting an exclusive. <laughs> um, I had this idea when I was really young that I wanted to work with autistic children and children with disabilities. And the best way that I could do that is horses. For them to learn how to be gentle, re-interact. Mm -hmm. And horses are creatures that are very, very, very in tune to, you know, somebody's emotions. I think it would be the same way with wildland firefighters and their families. They can go horseback riding. They can have some of the camping experience without shitting in the woods. Right. <laughs> and so you want to you want to kind of develop like an equine therapy for wild and fire birds, and not parents. just them. It's mainly for the families and whatnot because I know that the families suffer at times just as much as we do. And we don't call home. There's days where we may have service and we're just too mentally exhausted to hear any problems that are going at home. So I can honestly say that there have been many wildland firefighters that say, hey, I'm not going to have service for a few days. And they're full shit. But that's right. because they don't want to deal with the problems at home because they have too many problems going on where they're at now. Yes. Yeah. That, I mean, structural firefighters do that too. Yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> uh, we were just busy with calls. Yeah. Hey, today's today's just one of those days where it's just really really busy. Sorry. No, shit yeah. Like Obviously, it's just because we don't want to deal with the stresses at home. We got too much other stress to do. Yeah, sometimes it's too exhausting just to even send a text because you know you're going to get a reply back. Right. And you're like, fuck. Right. I think that's a good idea. I think that you can definitely do that. I don't see what's stopping you from growing. Figuring out how to even do that. Logistics? Yeah. Start looking at other similar type of things and and i have that blueprint but i like to learn and relearn and relearn that one yeah we did talk <laughs> about that <laughs> <laughs> so, it's gonna be yeah it's gonna be interesting so the people you've met through this like i've met some pretty amazing people you oh. obviously being one of them and you know I've, I've been able i've been blessed enough to meet you in person um Granted, you were late when you uh, showed up. I don't know if you want to share that story as to why you were late. Or, you know, I can let it be. Uh, I said I was going to bring this up, and I'm going to. Um, so I'm giving you the chance and the option here to share how you saw it going down. 
Okay. So remember that story that you told me where you had a shitty situation Mm -hmm. and you had to go during a structure fire? Yes. Yeah. Well, I missed my flight because I I needed to take a shit. So (laughs) it happens. Not really, but I, I believe you were in the middle of a live and I called and I was like, Oh, you, I was practically in tears. You, you called me crying. <laughs> I was the worst fear. This was my first flight by myself. Well, I, I think what happened was Jess, hot mess Jess was with us. Mm-hmm. And I was on a live. And um, you tried calling. Obviously, I was on the live. And I said, Jess, call Lauren, see what's going on. And Jess gets on the phone with you. And uh, we're FaceTiming and <clears throat> she starts kind of laughing. She's she trying, no. she's trying to be serious. She tried her hardest. She tried to be sincere and everything. She and really she's just did. Like, no, what's wrong? Are you okay? And then she kind of, she doesn't, she says, Hey, here's Lauren. And I see you and you're crying. I'm like, Oh my, what's wrong? What's wrong? And you're like, I miss my Who died? And I'm like, I'm like, are you kidding me? Cause you talked about being scared that you might miss a flight prior to all this and you're like i never i i I hate flying you know i feel like i'm gonna miss my flight and everything it was just like just be where you need to be when you get there it's not that hard you're like yeah well i answer the phone you're sitting in the airport still and you have tears in your eyes and i'm Mm -hmm. like what's wrong are you okay and you're like i missed my flight and i'm like no you bullshit you're like no i missed my flight and i was just like what the fuck happened And you're like hmm well, because uh, you even said you're like you had a three hour hour layover. layover. You had a three hour hour <laughs> layover. How the fuck did you miss your flight? And you just went. I had to take a shit, <laughs> <laughs> and I laughed. I st- I just started you, laughing. You, well, no, you did the <laughs> what? What? I was like, no, you didn't. You're like, no, I was, I was taking a shit. I think I yelled at you in the middle of the airport. I was like, who the fuck makes that up? Yeah. And, and you're like, I was sitting, I was sitting on the toilet and I hear them calling my name on the intercom and I was yelling for somebody. Nobody was listening. And, uh, <laughs> oh, man. So, so needless, to, needless to say, you were three hours late getting to uh, the Houston area and, uh, Oh my I god! Got put, was, I got put on the red eye. <laughs> you got put on the red eye because your brown eye needed to expel some shit. Oh my god, that was so hilarious! I oh, couldn't, so I couldn't funny. even like fathom like what and was going you, on at that point. I was like, this did not just happen. And, Literally, and my like, worst fear. I told you, I was just it. like, you know, it's okay. You're on the next flight. It's no big deal. Calm down. You're gonna get here. Just don't go take another shit. <laughs> Damn. Uh, uh, yeah, I had to tell that story on the podcast. I'm sorry. I, it's like, it happens, I told man. you, it I am never it going to, to let the you best of us. No, it does not. Fuck yeah, it does, man. No, it really doesn't. It really <laughs> fucking doesn't. Um, especially with a three hour layover. Like, who goes and takes a shit literally 15 minutes before boarding? Who does it? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, she's raising her hand. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was coming. Like there was there was no time. <laughs> there was no. We we're we're talking about the sweats were coming on, and then you see the line to the boarding. And you're in group B and you realize oh, that group God. A still has to go. And you're just like, I got time. You could have, we can you do could this. have taken a shit on the plane. You could have taken a shit on the plane. When you have group A already lined up right. and group B. They board pretty quickly. Not that quickly. Yeah. Well, it was that quickly. It, it was not that quickly. I was stuck there for a half an hour. It well, <laughs> they boarded that quickly once you decided to go expel. 
you gotta go, you gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, yeah, I t- I'm sorry. Yeah, that's gonna be all over the world. Everyone's gonna hear yeah, that. People so. in Australia, New Zealand, everywhere. Hey, people are gonna be like, yeah, she's not, she's not fucking lying, man. No, they're pretty much gonna be like, that's never happened. You took a shit in the middle of a structure fire. I don't want to hear it. Yeah, but it, I was there's oh, plenty of people different. there to get the job done. Yeah, I wasn't the building, late for anything. The, the building, the yeah, man, yeah, you were. I wasn't late for anything. Other guys were putting out the fire. We were just, you know, overhauled, poking holes and shit. I, I, I gotta ask, mm-hmm. was the toilet seat warm? Was it like one of those heater toilet seats? No, the ho- the part of the house we were in, it was just a little smoky. It wasn't too bad. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was just a toilet. <laughs> I, I'm picturing like all this like flame action going around, and you know, oh no, 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 it wasn't like that. No, it was just a little smoky. It was the, the fire was on the opposite side of the house. We were doing some uh, uh, overhaul, looking for extensions and stuff like that. And I was like, hey, I need to go, and they're like, okay, go. I wasn't the first one to ever do it. Definitely won't be the last one ever. Really. I am not the first to miss their flight because they had to go to the bathroom. You're the first person I know. Well. Do you know anybody else that has missed their flight because they're the issue? See, point in case. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> oh, man. All right, Lord. I'm going to go ahead and start wrapping this up. Um, okay. Thank you for everything. Seriously, thank you thank for you having me on here. Thank you for giving me the time that I needed to be able to do this. I told you I would never force you. I wouldn't. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna push you to do something not comfortable. Right? True. And when it comes but, to these, when it comes to these kind of conversations, you need to have. You need to start when you're ready to start. And yeah. I, I see what you're doing now and the advocacy you have for it and the change that you're starting to make. I see that and I fucking applaud you for it. I think you're badass and I'm always going to love you for who you are and for what you're doing and for being a friend. So, boom. I love you too, man. <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks for giving me the idea to do it. You're welcome. You're welcome. And thanks for How hard me. was that? Bit. How hard was it? A little bit. Saying you're welcome. Well, you said accepting the idea. Well, yeah, yeah gave, because you what you're idea. doing, what you're doing for everybody, getting people to speak up, putting that idea there. Yeah, but people still have to make. It's the beginning. True. So but I'll like you said earlier in the idea. podcast, it was. It's just an idea, and it takes more people to break, and you started everybody on this, so I'm you're pretty trying. awesome for doing that. Thank you. I'm going to stop talking about me. Usually at the end of the show, I ask about three questions. Uh, you've heard the show before, and they meant to spark another five, ten-minute conversation, or another three-minute conversation. You can answer them with one rattle. Okay. Questions. Um, we are on the uh, Lauren Fire podcast, and the guest today is Warren from the Lauren Fire podcast. What's the one question you would have asked yourself and or piece of information you would have liked to share that maybe we didn't touch on? Ooh. How... My twin sister and I are on our competitive side. All right. And how that plays into our careers. Answer it. Well, how about you do the three questions and then I'll tie it. This is is part of one of the questions. Oh. You're supposed to ask yourself and then answer it. Um, We constantly challenge ourselves. Mm Mm-hmm. And I think that this was one of those challenges we were both afraid of. And I just happened to be the first. 
Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> Jamie, 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 if you're watching this, I want you to see this. Mike, drop. Damn. I just, I just dropped the microphone for everybody that's listening on the audio version <laughs> of the podcast. Yeah. Damn, girl. <laughs> I got nothing for that. Jamie, <laughs> Jamie, you have been called out on a worldwide podcast, girl. <laughs> yeah. You have been called the fuck out. Yeah, well. Hey, she, ha she has my number. She can call me if she wants to be like, you know what? Fuck this. Let's do it. <laughs> um. All right. Well, yeah, y'all, if you don't know how competitive Lauren and Jamie are, go to Lauren's uh, TikTok here. Lauren Fire 2232. Mm -hmm. Ooh, I remember. Oh, shit. And check out some of her videos with her sister. You can see these women will kick your ass, so uh, don't fuck with them. And they kick each other's asses. Actually, oh, yeah. There's some videos of them kicking each other's asses, and it's actually it's quite fun to watch. Uh, second question, Lauren. Simple. Oh, yeah. Do mm -hmm. you have any questions for me? Um, yeah. Well, I'm sure you have a bunch. Yeah, I'm only answering one. Okay. What do you <laughs> think that you're going to do once this takes off? What do you mean? What, what do I think? Once your nonprofit gets lifted and you're, you have that capability, where do you see yourself within the nonprofit organization as far as public speaking? anything like that. I am open to all possibilities of what the nonprofit can bring. But first and foremost is making sure that we help the people that the nonprofit is set out to help. After that, anything and everything that continues that mission, I'll do. I'll sacrifice. I mean, shit, do you want to put me on a, a dumbass show where uh, I, I'm competing over stupid shit just for the chance to raise some money for my other, my brothers and sisters that need it. I'll do it. You want me to be a public speaker and talk about my story and share my story? I'll do it. I do it now. I have no problem doing it. This is the only thing, the only fucking thing I would leave the fire department for. This is the only fucking thing I do it for. And the reason being is because this is dedicated to helping my brothers and sisters so they can continue doing the job. Mm -hmm. They can continue providing that service. They can continue living a life worth living for themselves that they don't ever have to get as low as I do. And to me, that still keeps me in my head as a civil servant in that I am making sure that the people that are staying on the line are doing it knowing that there's somebody out there that has their back no matter what. With their mental health, with just needing someone to talk to, with getting the help and that they, they're looking for, all of it. This is the mm -hmm. only thing that I would be willing to retire early from the fire department for. If I can <laughs> when I get this nonprofit to the point where we can go to employee status, the podcast and the nonprofit will be the number one thing that I do. I would love to start traveling the country and talking to more fire departments, talking to uh, civil service members, talking to crowds in general. I don't care. Uh, I, my, my main purpose now is to kill the stigma that is talking about mental health because I couldn't talk about it when mm -hmm. I should have been able to. I almost became a statistic because of my yeah. depression, because of my anxiety. I have found a way to start beating that and I want to share it. And 
how I share that, I don't care. Put me in front of a camera, put me in the newspaper, put me on the radio, put me put me on more pod put me on other people's podcasts, put me wherever. If I can share my idea in hopes that it and, and share my story and what I've been through, share the the hard fucking conversation that not a lot of people are um wanting to have. But showing them that it's okay to have it. Yeah. I'm willing to put myself there. That's what I want. Good. <laughs> Yay. No, I yeah. would expect nothing <laughs> less. Yeah. You're not I, I, you're not somebody that just chooses one job. You're somebody that needs to be utilized in all areas. And that's kind of what <laughs> um. <laughs> firefighter brain. Sorry, hold on. <laughs> trying, yeah, trying, to gutter, trying to get it out of the gutter. Trying to get it out of the gutter. Hold on. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it didn't work. Anyway, um, utilized in all things. Yeah, I like that. <clears throat> all areas. And you perform well. God bless it. <laughs> it's not what I mean, guys, people of the world. Um, you heard it here you, first, folks. I perform well. Yeah. Confirmation. Okay. <laughs> she has no idea how I perform. No. <laughs> Wait, in that aspect? No. Wait, which aspect? Of what, what? Where are we at now? I have no idea. This took a really bad turn. <laughs> this is the kind of conversation that would have got us kicked off TikTok. Wait, let me rephrase. Oh, would have got Christ. me kicked off TikTok. Yeah. yeah, no. I wouldn't have been. Yeah, yeah, it wouldn't have been you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Boobs. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, my last question. You're in the What Makes Us Fire podcast. Um, a lot of people hear the term and they're like, oh, what makes us firefighters and stuff like that. No, the term what makes us fire is more that fire inside of us. Mm -hmm. What makes us do the things that we do because we love them, right? What makes us decide to be firefighters, to be civil service members, to be people to try to help? What do you think it is? What do you think it is that makes you fire? What gives you that fire? What is it? Because when our house was burning down, figuratively speaking, the area, the, the way that I grew up, all it took was two people to start helping others out of that situation, whether it be out through a window or through a car. And that's what started it. Because mm -hmm. there's not many people out there that are capable of doing that. Why do you think it is, or how do you think it is that you're able to sustain that want and drive? Because one way or another, everybody has been in that type of situation, mm -hmm. whether it be in their own house, in their head, or in their mm -hmm. own situation. And it's that flight freeze run type scenario mm -hmm. we're some of the few that are able to help and understand and use our life to be beneficial to our job so you, you think it comes from life experience and how we decided to or what we decided to make that life experience mean? Yes. 
where did you, this is you, where did you mm-hmm. find the capability or want to have that be your driving thing? Um, when you asked me that question, I go back to what made me decide to become a firefighter. And there's only one situation that I can recall. And that was during uh, the Grand Prix fire. We were living in Lake Arrowhead. And uh, yeah, our shit was burning down. And our family had to be evacuated. And I saw all these firefighters police officers, EMTs, escorting, didn't matter who it was, taking people on their rigs and stuff just to get them out. And I remember seeing on the news that there was a family that was brought out of a situation where uh, the kids were being held captive. And that's kind of where that started. I probably tied it into my own situation and own life experience, but no, they were legit. Amber alerts and stuff were out for them. Mm-hmm. And they found them because our area was burning down. And yeah. You wanted to be a part of it. Yeah. So that goes back to your life experience mm-hmm. allowing you to decide and be that driving force. Yeah. Because all int- it took was a oops. That's interesting. Um, a lot of, you, you think you're like the second person that said life experience kind of helped them dictate and make that decision to continue to be that, that type of person that wants to help. And I, I still find it fascinating that you still had a choice. You still have a choice to not help. Mm-hmm. You didn't want to, but you help anyway. Yeah. And that, where that comes from, I think is a little bit harder to explain. Because, yeah, okay, she wants to make sure that she's a part of something that she had to go through and she can help and all this other stuff, but what is driving her to make that choice because you can just be like fuck it i went through it they can go through it too they'll be fine you know you could there's a whole bunch of choices you can make i did have that mentality right and now you're making a different choice now and what drives you to make that choice is sometimes really hard to explain yeah because you can use the same you can use the same thing. Well, it's my life choices that make me make the choice to not want to be a part of it because I don't want to see it. But you're making the choice that I don't want. I want to do what I can to make sure others don't have to go through it. Yes. And where that want comes from, I don't think is explained. Yet. I really it's don't. It's not. Well, Lauren, thank you so much again for coming on the show. And thank you for sharing everything you have. Uh, I will be expecting you down here in the Texas area soon. Yes. Uh, We have a meetup coming up in October. Uh, You said you might be able to make it down here for that. And we have somebody that you and I said we would go hang out. Yes. She did win. Yeah, so whenever you get down here, we'll go do that. We'll go have some fun. Probably go hang out on the beach again or something. I don't know. We'll just have fun. Yes, fun. it'll be great. It'll be a great time. So it will be. I'm excited. I'm excited too. All right. Um, I don't have anything else. Well, where where can uh, where can everybody find uh, find you on social media, real quick? Uh, TikTok. That is the only place. Um, Facebook and stuff is meant for friends and close family. Okay. 
So, so TikTok is Lauren Fire twenty two thirty two. Uh, no underscore or anything, just Lauren Fire 2232. You guys go mm -hmm. check her out. She's awesome. She's funny. She's easy on the eyes. I'm not hitting. Anyway, uh, what makes us our family? Have fun, stay safe. Remember, it's just another piece out of the world. You never know if you're going to be doing it. It's a you want to see in the world. Don't allow the world to be how you want to see that chat. Just be better. Much love. Peace. Peace. Bye. There it is. <laughs>
I have to say that the National Suicide Prevention Hotline and SuicidePreventionLifeline.org have not and do not endorse What Makes Us Fire podcast or nonprofit in any way, shape, or form. These are just two general resources that we here at What Makes Us Fire truly believe can help you start your conversation. Y'all, I can't thank you enough for everything. This episode was the 51st episode. We are just over a year old and we just keep growing. I'm not going to stop. I don't care if the numbers are small, big, average. None of that matters to me. I'm here because I went through something that I don't want another brother or sister to go through. I share my story and I find people wanting to share theirs in hopes that we can help someone else not get to that point that we did. Nothing in this life worth having. Keep going. Keep going. It's worth it. Y'all have fun. Stay safe. Show some love and peace out in the world. You never know who's going to need it. You never know if you'll be the one to make a difference. Being that difference, yeah, feels pretty damn good. Be the change you want to see in the world. Don't let that world tell you how you want to see that change come about. Get beat up. Just be better. Much love. Catch you on the next. Peace.